What's up my fellow poker enthusiasts, it's Renee aka The Wacko here and together with my co-host Adam Carmichael we present to you the Mechanics of Poker podcast. In this podcast we deconstruct high stakes poker players, figuring out what it is about them, how they think, what they do that makes them so successful with an extra focus on the obstacles they faced and the skills they had to develop to surpass them. Over the years, me and Adam have gained a lot of experience in both reaching high stakes poker ourselves and teaching other players to do the same. We have bundled all this knowledge together in our coaching program, The Mechanics of Poker, which is the most complete poker coaching product on the market. If you want to have a chance to work with me and Adam so you can get unstuck and make more progress in your poker career, go over to mechanicsofpoker.com to apply. But without further ado, let's learn from another high stakes player's journey in today's episode. Welcome back to another episode of the Mechanics of Poker podcast. Today we will be chatting with longtime Hungarian high stakes poker player Laszlo Molnar, aka Laco87GCB online. If you are ever in Budapest and see a black Lamborghini spider driving around, it's not Batman, but chances are it's Laszlo Molnar. Over the past 15 years, Laszlo has used poker to play his way to financial freedom by consistently crushing online games, live games, MTTs, and both cash games. He dedicates his success not to talent, but to his ability to learn anything and go all in. This has helped him level up not only his poker career, but also his health and relationships. Next to this ability, he labels himself as a hardcore science, fact, data-oriented person. Therefore, he managed to avoid falling victim of survival bias. While he agrees being motivated and thinking positive is indeed important, it's not the main cause of success. Instead of using power of attraction or brain control, or as he likes to call it, woozy, wheezy, fugazi stuff, In this podcast with Laszlo, we will stick to the facts of what contributes to success. As always, I'm joined by the fittest co-host in the poker industry, co-mechanics of poker coach, Mr. Mindset and Performance, Adam Carmichael. Adam, what do you think he means when he mentions woozy, wheezy, fugazi stuff out of curiosity? I think he means non-data driven stuff, more like feeling, intuition, kind of stuff that's not driven by science and factual information. And yeah, really excited for today's guest. He sounds like a very data-driven systems-based guy, and he's had a very long career. And success leaves clues. If someone's been around in poker, making money for 15 years plus, they've learned a lot of things that will help you as a poker player to evolve as well. And yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing how he's evolved over the years. And he also sounds like he has quite a holistic approach to lifestyle, to performance. So looking forward to diving deep into all the things he's done to optimize his performance. Yeah, I'm very curious for that as well. But before we start, we have teamed up with some partners in the poker industry that in our experience help boost your poker career. First one being Universal Poker. If you are playing online poker without a good rakeback deal, you are leaving free money at the tables. This is where our partnership with Universal comes in. Whether you are making a new account or want to boost your existing account, we can give you the best deals on the market. What sets Universal apart, though, in my opinion, in today's market is carefully selecting the sites that they work with, only making deals with sites that have their shit together and that offer clear lines of communication with the higher ups on the site. Now, because of this line of communication, this makes them more like personal assistance for players rather than just an affiliate, which, in my opinion, adds a big boost to the deal. Visit universalpoker.com. Link in the description and be sure to enter the code MECHANICS to get the exclusive deals we have arranged for our listeners. Go to universalpoker.com and use MECHANICS. Next up, GTO Wizard. If you are a frequent listener of the podcast, you know that 90% of our guests get ahead in today's games by using GTO Wizard. It's by far the most accessible tool if you want to use GTO and get ahead as well. We are proud to announce a technological breakthrough. Introducing GTO Wizard AI. This powerful technology can solve any custom poker spot in seconds to high accuracy. Unlike pre-solved solutions, this allows you to edit the solving parameters. That means you can modify the ranges, change the stack and pot sizes, customize the betting tree, and automatically simplify and optimize your bet sizes. Brace yourself, the meta is about to change. 
So sign up to GTO Wizard using the link below, gtowizard.com slash mechanics. Get 10% off on your first month and join the weekly coaching webinars of which one per month is with me. Looking forward on educating you guys over there. But without further ado, let's get into our pod with Laszlo. Laszlo, great to have you on the pod, man. Hey, uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. No worries, no worries. You've been playing poker for 15 years and have acquired big success in both cash, MTT, live and online. When Googling you, not much came up besides like a Dan Bolzerian like Instagram account. <laughs> Was this lifestyle one of the motivators for you to pursue a career in poker? But yeah, like uh, mo mostly what motivated me is just uh, just the lifestyle. You can you can travel and uh, and play tournaments, and it's just be your own boss, do everything in your schedule. Like I I always hated to have to wake up for something which I don't like to do, but if I had to wake up something I I really was I was really looking forward to uh, that was that was amazing so uh, I, I started with poker at the university basically and uh, yeah it, it was a such a great opportunity when I realized I, I could do this for a living uh, and just be free travel around the world Oh, you definitely done your fair share of traveling. Did you have any like role models? Because straight away you saw poker as like an opportunity to provide a certain lifestyle that attracted to you. Did you have any like role models that you could see like, hey, I want to be like that guy? Ooh, uh, yeah, I, I definitely had many role models in the during my career. But um, in the beginning, uh, I basically only saw like live live pros like live famous players like Daniel Negran and uh, Phil Helmut and stuff like high stakes poker uh, and it was hard to relate to them because that was so much different but uh, I basically I started my online journey on, on pokerstrategy.com where you could get this $50 stuff and there were like free coachings uh, where you can you know, you just join to a coaching and like 15 people. And there was this guy, Raleigh, 25, who was already playing, I think, mostly PLO. And I, I, I just joined to a class of his to just ask him, like, is this real? Like, you can, you can get money? Like, it, it felt such a gambling to me. And, and that was my first promise that, okay, I don't want to lose any, any money. So only... The maximum I do is I, I put zero money in it, but if I can get like $50 for free and I can build something out of it, uh, then I do it. So I, I asked this Raleigh guy, like, is it, is it like you can live? Like you, you, you're doing only this and like you travel and, and stuff, stuff. And he's like, yeah, 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 you can do it. And, and he was very, very friendly, very nice guy. So actually helped me uh, so he he, uh, he basically convinced me that you can you can do this as a living and, and gave me confidence but the twist of the story is this guy um, uh, went broke pretty quickly and then like he, he owned people money he owned me money and uh, fortunately he paid me but after that I heard like many people didn't get paid and uh, he just disappeared i never heard anything about him anymore but yeah uh, it it helped me a little bit so i get i get so i guess he was first first he was kind of the role model like okay well you could actually do this and then i guess he became a role model example of like mm, there's also a downside yeah, so... to, to poker so maybe we should yeah. you know try, try to get this sh our shit together yeah 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 so I, I just derailed so much in the story, but the, yeah, the, the real role model stuff is like, it, it, at the beginning, I, I didn't have like very um, like exact role model in that stuff, in that uh, view. But after, yeah, obviously like 
OTB Red Baron, I mean, much, much later. It, it was also a different kind of role model because you couldn't see anything about him, like no, no uh, pictures, no interviews like this, no. Uh, I mean, he, he had that two plus two um, thread, right? Yeah. Where he's like, I'm going to refocus yeah. on 500 NL Zoom. I think that yeah. was uh, definitely, I remember I was reading that thread and that was definitely a big role model as motivator and then you saw him basically crush 500 nil zoom move up and suddenly he was playing heads up against fish kacha all those guys you know who were <laughs> who were at the top at that point uh and he was basically crushing them so that was it was motivating because like through a threat on two plus two you can really hear the story also like behind the scenes right whereas maybe like Danny Nugranu and uh all these guys on like high yeah. six poker you only see like a moment of studio you know it's like a, a moment of glamour Yeah, and uh, and also it was such a weird feeling to me that basically, yeah, my role models were definitely these live uh, famous players. And when you are a couple of years into your career and, and you realize that, oh, actually, some of these guys are not even good anymore, like even playing like fish. <laughs> and it was just such a weird feeling. I I remember I couldn't even admit to myself like i had to wait and uh, meet with a very very good player and ask him like i mean do you do you really think this and that famous guy is not even a good player and it's like yeah yeah it's fish <laughs> so it 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 was also i i remember do you guys remember if uh, you guys had a like before facebook there was so many different kind of Uh, platforms mm -hmm. and I remember I, I had like a Hungarian uh, social media something and uh, I had the picture of Daniel Negreanu like biggest role model and I, I the caption was like he can turn your brain into shit because he had these famous videos like when he when he reads people like the exact card and uh, and I really wanted to be like him And I remember I was very, very annoying uh, playing live because I was always talking like, you know, these guys who are in the pot and you're like, oh, you must have Ace King. I think you have Ace King. And, and people are like, oh, just shut up and play. We don't, we don't care about that. And, yeah, if Danny on the ground who does it, it's, it's fun, you know. But when Laszlo does it, it's like, oh, there's this annoying, yeah, it, annoying Hungarian guy that cannot shut up. Yeah, and then later you go to a different place, like Patrick Antonin's face, where you don't talk at all, like no words during a hand. Uh, you just don't say anything. So I had these faces. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you, I, I love them. You did, did, did you straight away knew that poker was a skill game? Because I can imagine, like you asked this guy, right, is this real? Did you think it was more of a gambling game or when was like the first time that you realized, oh, wait, there's actually quite a lot of skill in poker. Maybe you developed like some sort of strategy and were like, oh, wait, this is actually winning. Yeah, so actually I started a, a little bit earlier playing live because we had this huge poker boom uh, in Hungary too. And all of my friends were like playing poker and they were like, okay, let's, let's do a home game for like 500 Hungarian foreign entry, which was like $2. <laughs> and we played on a ping pong table in a basement or something. And it felt like gambling. Like I lost 500 foreign and two, two bucks. And I was like, oh, geez, I'm not sure I should do this. Like we usually just get together, play something and you don't lose money. So it felt like gambling, but Very soon, I discovered the books of Dan Harrington, uh, like tournament play stuff. And obviously, it was pretty clear to me that there is some strategic uh, stuff you can, you can um, improve a lot. We also had many, many misconceptions. Like, I, I remember a funny story. We were playing like a three dollar sitango and and uh, i i bet on the river whatever and my friend very quickly calls there was a flush possible on the board and i'm like 
I was bluffing. He called me. I'm like, how, how did you know I don't have a uh, I don't have a flush? He's like, yeah, because last hand you had a flush, and it's impossible to have flush two times in a row. There's <laughs> just so little chance that you cannot have a flush. Uh, so like stuff like this, and and I remember this, and I like, yeah, okay, okay, I have to keep in mind. But yeah, then you you quickly realize that independent. <laughs> Uh, chances so it, yeah so so we played a lot of like these games and started to read some books and, and that was more than enough to beat my friends they didn't read any books so yeah that's <laughs> it sounds very similar to my story like you start to you start to read the book and then your friends are like oh yeah did, did the book tell you to do that you know Especially if you lose, it's like, oh, yeah, great book. I would read more books if I was you, stuff like that. So you definitely open yourself yeah, up to getting needled. Exactly. I was wondering, have you been like competitive in other sports or games before you started playing poker? Yeah, uh, somewhat. I, I wasn't really professional. I was just probably dreaming about it. So the first thing I was playing um, competitively was, was, was the Quake 3 Arena. If you guys are familiar with it, yeah, yeah for um, sure, shooter game, right? Yeah, so uh, we didn't really have internet connection. We had like 56k modem, something, which was really, really slow and really expensive. So basically, I was just uh, playing uh, against bots, like you know, that was the nightmare, uh, hardest possible bot you can play and I I was practicing all day every day I, I read about the you can you can go a tournament and then qualify to the world cyber games in in Korea South Korea that, that was the big dream like 15 years old you can win like ten thousand dollars so I was practicing and playing every day all day like no strategy nothing just just play and I managed to beat these bots like 50 zero like it's, it cannot be better than that to to beat these bots and i remember i went for the first like uh tour amateur tournament in in a very close village and i played my first match and i got lost like minus one to 40 minus one you get when you even kill yourself accidentally <laughs> so I was completely destroyed and I quickly realized that, okay, humans play much different than, than bots and you cannot just play the same as you play against bots. So I, uh, yeah, we, we did a couple of years of that and I competed the, the Hungarian qualifier for the World Cyber Games, but I didn't have like any success. I probably, I won one match and, and lost the, the other uh very badly uh but yeah played a couple of years and and i was hopeful but then work up three came out and i switched to that and by then we had good internet connection and everything and there was battle net you can practice every day online so that was much better we still didn't have any strategic like we, we didn't know how to do strategic stuff. I, I remember like very basics. I in back to the Quake 3 arena. If if you kill someone, there is a there are respawning spots where he could respawn. And obviously we get like replays from the best players and we were watching the best replays. And you can remember like where could they spawn and like when you kill them straight away go for a spawn spot and if you are lucky you can get a key another kill so like very very basic stuff and work up three also like super basic stuff but nothing fancy and yeah i did that a couple of years too and uh, i had better success in that so we had a tournament uh, near to my to my home village and uh, i I won the one versus one competition and I was a friend of my best friend uh, playing two, two versus two as well. And we won that too. So it was like best feeling ever. I remember I had a, 
I, I didn't do diary, but on that day I had to write it down to a TXT file. I hope I find it some, some somewhere sometime. Uh, I was like happiest guy in the world, like 16, 17 years old. And I went home to my mom and show like, yeah, I just won like 300 bucks uh, in Hungarian foreign. And he was like, she was like, what? Like, really? Yeah, play, you like won uh, play, playing, playing video games, right? Yeah, playing Where video, video games, games were quite new, especially to a generation like your mother. And I was like, wait, you made money of video games? Yeah, it was so much fun. So then also the, the World Cyber Games qualifier came and uh, I finished like fifth, I think. So it was pretty good result, but only the first got to, to the South Korea mm. uh, area. Uh, but that was actually a really, really funny story. Uh, <clears throat> so there was this guy called Warbringer or something that was the Hungarian guy who, who beat everyone like I had no chance so it wasn't even close um, he was the best for sure and then he he qualified to South Korea and he got there, there on the in, in Korea there was like brackets like groups for uh, people for four people groups and the first two goes forward and then like it's a it's a three and uh, he got like the sickest uh, group so there was like a groupie uh, i'm sure heard of him like it's a big twitch channel he's still mm. playing workup free he's oh, a wow. dutch guy actually dutch guy too oh wow. and uh, it's he, he was 4k team 4k groupie he's a very fun guy love his videos he, he was one of the best at the time and there was one more guy I can't remember, like top three or something. And there was one guy like nobody knew. And he was from Ethiopia. Like what? And there was the Hungarian guy. So he lost both matches to the to the top ones. So uh -huh. obviously not going forward. And then he plays uh, the, the Ethiopian guy. And he's like max focus, like building the base, getting the hero, like the, everything on point everything is calculated and then he gets to the to the guy's base and the guy doesn't even know what to do like didn't even have a hero like building building different buildings that he needs like clearly doesn't even know the rules and turned out that the guy was actually playing command and conquerors generals and made to the south korea qualifier but they last minute canceled the CNT generals, so no, no generals, but he already had like the slot. So he's like, I'll play Warcraft work. instead. And then they What's said, the like, difference? okay, let's, let's put in Warcraft 3. Yeah, so it's, 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 so like I'll say, it's like sitting me down like, oh, I came here to play an Olympic home cash game. Sorry, there's only a rest tournament. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'll, I'll hop in there, no problem. <laughs> I mean, nobody understood this, but it was funny because basically any Hungarian player who would get the South Korean seat would have the same result because losing to the two best and then winning to the Ethiopian. Maybe even my mother would, would have, have the, the same, same result. result. <laughs> would, would, would be probably a close draw with the uh, uh, Ethiopian guy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what is it? I mean, poker also obviously very competitive environment, esports, especially nowadays, and especially in Korea. I mean, Korea, they get very competitive when it comes down to esports. What is it that you like about competing? Uh, it's an interesting question because I always thought um, I became competitive because of these games in my childhood and I became like this in poker because of that. But if, you, if I think about it more deeply, I was that at day, day one. So when I started playing Quake 3 Arena, I was like, okay, I, I want to be the best. I want to earn money with this so it's hard to say i think it's it's probably something like genetics because i can't even remember anything would trigger that and i had other friends doing the same but they were not as motivated as me definitely they were very 
smart and and uh, good at it, but they were not that motivated. Um, so so not sure, but obviously later in in poker it was much easier because it was like a, a, a straight answer to your problems. Like, what do you mean with that money, straight answer money, to your problems? Like like if if you would like to in that time being an esport professional it was like a fuzzy dream it's not sure you can do anything or even if you're the best maybe not earning that much money but 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 later in uh, in the university where you had like poker and like huge uh stories successful stories winning millions and traveling a lot that was like a obvious answer that yeah i could i could definitely choose that over my so i, I was learning uh, programming and mathematics in the university and it was my second year when i got into poker and uh, it was a couple months later i was i was 100 percent sure i'm gonna do this instead of the the profession i would have there you did the math and you were like math checks out poker poker career is is the way forward yeah you yeah. you also mentioned that it's both a strength and a weakness of yours that you can get easily hooked on something and when you really like something right you go and go all in is that kind of then linked to like that competitive competitive nature like if yeah, you're going to do something I, you know you jump in fully so exactly yeah i think uh, definitely it's it's the same um I have a couple examples to that. I, I have, so it's, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a gift that I'm very interested and motivated in stuff and, and I can get into deep and quickly, but after a while it could hurt for other areas of your life. And um, so I can give you a recent example. Uh, like four or five years ago, I started playing the piano and I took coachings from, from a, a guy. And I, he told me that I need to learn uh, music theory for sure if I want to be good. And I started learning music theory. I loved it. I even can see similarities in poker. And so it, it was fun and uh, definitely helped with the music as well and now i have problems like i grind i have to focus on the grind and i put on some music just just some background music and i start thinking oh this this song would be so nice uh, in a piano version let me google if there is a piano version or is there a music sheet i could learn and then i derailed from my session and uh, like mm -hmm. completely lost um so yeah these stuff these, these stuff definitely makes it harder to focus on one thing i mean yeah i i get that I, I would say i'm very similar when you start dividing things also it's not as satisfying because you you know you know you could do better if you would put all your time in it and that's way more satisfying so yeah juggling multiple things at the same time can definitely relate it doesn't give the same amount of uh, satisfaction you mentioned that there were similarities in in poker theory and in music theory and i guess also similarity or i guess it's a skill that kind of the art of learning is kind of a skill right i i remember a yeah. book i think it literally called the art of learning josh waitskin if i'm not mistaken like a, a chess prodigy he was if i'm not mistaken in the past and he mentioned that like if you learn a skill and if you learn how to learn you can then use that knowledge to learn other skills have you so I'm, I'm curious first for the for the similarities between music theory and poker theory and then i'm curious like what did you learn about learning itself that made it maybe also uh, easier for you to start building other skills on current skills yeah i, I definitely agree with you and and even if you just look at poker it's there are multiple stuff you can juggle with like you can learn mtt you can learn heads up you can learn plo so even if you try to play multiple poker stuff you still 
dividing your time and, and you don't have that much time into one thing you should focus probably. Um, so yeah, it's definitely the, the learning process. Um, I, I think um, I, I'm really good at managing um, information and, and searching for information. And uh, I think I can quickly find out if it's useful or like not very useful or, or like basically maybe even bullshit. Um, and uh, so actually with the piano, I started with an application, uh, which was like, you, you play on the keyboard and, and it shows a sheet. And if you hit the right key, it recognize the key and, and uh, moves you forward. So it was like a key flow or something, something like that. And I, it didn't feel, feel very good because you learned what you should press but you didn't learn anything about the hand movement or, mm. uh, or anything like that. So I went, I remember I went to the piano teacher and I was like, yeah, I already learned a song by myself. Uh, can I present it to you? And after 10 seconds, she was, okay, stop this. This is really bad. And, <laughs> and then she started correcting the stuff I did wrong, uh, but she was actually a terrible teacher. She was like a, like a Russian teacher from 1980s. Like, oh, like a drill master. The, nice. Yeah, exactly. So you couldn't even understand the, the exercise, but she was like, do it, do it, do it faster. But why, why don't you do it? Like, don't stop. So it's like super high pressure. I didn't like it at all. And then I switched and uh, met with this guy from from a, <clears throat> from his is a university uh, learning music, and he he was really really good and basically taught me the basics, the right right stuff, how to do it. So I'm not always uh, into the you should get a coach like straight away. But in this area, definitely, obviously, it's so, so skill or, or like mechanics dependent, like how do you use your, your fingers and stuff. So it definitely needed a coach for that. But maybe, I'm not sure, maybe if you go to the gym, you don't have to get a coach first, but maybe it's not too either. So yeah, get a coach first. <laughs> yeah, I would I would say getting a coach first in whatever you do is probably best. I think it like it speeds up the learning curve so so fast. Even if like something simple yeah. as going to the gym, if you've been doing the wrong exercise for one year, yeah, it could be. Where hard. someone in the beginning could have ex immediately explained you the correct exercise, then you probably you know you get way more out of the time that you put into the gym. For example, you mentioned something yeah, interesting about like it being a skill to find the correct information. How does one filter? Like, what are signs that I think you said that this information is bullshit? Because especially in poker nowadays, there's a lot of information out there. So how do we filter for good information? What are like the signs of like, this is actually bullshit? For sure. Um, <clears throat> so I think the basic is just search a lot of information and you're gonna come across the same again. And usually it's, uh, it's working and, um, and you realize that that's what other coaches said as well. Mm. And maybe, yeah, in poker, it could be, could be still wrong for sure. But um, that's, that's one thing. Other thing is it's really weird when I, I remember I wanted to get some coaching pack on, on singing, how to learn to sing. And there was this guy, uh, he had an advertisement. I really liked it. It was so good, uh, perfectly what I needed, wasn't expensive. 
So I was like, okay, let's go, just buy. And when I clicked buy, he's like started to do these bullshit tricks like, okay, you know what, this is, uh, I have such a great day, you can have it half price and twice the stuff. And then you can, if you click that and that, and then, and, and uh, there were stuff he was saying was obvious bullshit because it was pre-recorded. How could he know it's like, you are the hundred person today and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, this was weird, but let's do it. So I click again, continue, let's buy it. And he's getting again, like, okay, you can spend 25 more and you get this and that. And basically he just, uh, I, I was just angry about it and didn't buy at all. <laughs> so it was, so, you know, it but probably would still worth it, but it was just so full of- The over-marketed it. Scammy, over-marketed, yeah. scammy stuff. I just didn't want to get, didn't want to get it. And uh, yeah. Marketing, marketing is interesting because like on one side, it is necessary because it works, but also if you over market, it can come across that you're overcompensating for a bad product. So you try to find kind of the sweet spot within marketing, but it seems like nowadays any marketing tactic that you use is immediately labeled as like, ah, oh, this is bullshit. You know, another one of these fake entrepreneurs online trying to tell you that they can teach you something. Yeah, it's, it's really hard because it's just uh, obviously you want to get, you want to have a good marketing because so many, I'm pretty sure there are like best books you could ever read, but you're going to never hear, hear about because just bad marketing. And there is the opposite when people have like such a good marketing, but such a shitty product. And I really like the, uh, it's definitely not working for everyone, but I really like the approach when you get stuff from free until the point you feel ashamed that you're not paying for this. So it's, I think it's a good example. I, I read many self-help books in my life, especially early on my career. And um, uh, I like, I don't even know, 10 years ago, I found like Gary V. It was like grind culture, going hard kind of guy. And I didn't, I never saw him selling basically anything. I just saw the videos. I liked the videos. And uh, I, I felt like I got so much value. I just, I just want to buy his book. Even, even if I wouldn't read it, I just want to pay him, pay this guy. Uh, to just have his book because he he gave me so much without any money so and, and i think your podcast is also like that i i watched so many good podcasts in here and learned so much stuff um i i or i'm already using and i i didn't have to pay anything so that's well, That's you're, a you're very, very good strategy. Actually. You're welcome. And I mean, you're you're giving something back to it, you know, for all the for awesome. all the high stakes poker players <laughs> listening to this conversation, you know, consuming and uh, you know, there there's definitely a couple of names that I now have in mind that I know that consume a lot of these content and that they're a little bit hesitant to come on himself. Maybe this is like a little push in the push in the right direction here from Laszlo. Um, you yeah. pursued like poker, you know, to get in that lifestyle. How did you? Or I guess I should reframe this. Like, how soon did you realize that this lifestyle that you maybe saw on high stakes poker is not acquired within a week, you know? And it's maybe a little bit harder than you initially expected. Or at least I'm assuming here. Maybe it went, like, straight away good from the start. But usually, you know, we think that, oh, yeah, just play a little bit of poker, get uh, get, get get to travel, get nice cars. Yeah, I definitely had my phases. I... I didn't have these expectations when I started for sure, because I started playing. Uh, so when I got my 50 bucks free money, I started playing these, the, the lowest stakes was only, lo lowest stakes were NL10. So there was like no NL2 and stuff. 
And this was the short, short stack strategy, like you sitting with 20 big blinds on ML10. And my, my strategy was sitting in 30 bigs, not 20, as they said, because I thought I can win more money. <laughs> that was my big strategy. Um, so there was such a slow stuff and I didn't even know that I can make money of this. And I, re I so clearly remember when I won like uh, over the months, maybe two months, I won like $400 and I still couldn't believe it, like if it's real. It was on the account, but nothing else. So there was uh, the Skrill, but it was called Money Bookers. And there was the international cash out fee on Money Bookers. So I had to transfer the funds from Money Bookers to, to my credit card or, or maybe, I, I'm not even sure, but I, had, I remember it was like 300 bucks and I had to pay 50 bucks for the, for the transaction. And I didn't care, like, is this gonna be a real money? And I had my plan that I want to buy uh, sunglasses I, I looked for and, uh, and a watch, like a cheap uh, designer watch. And I remember when I somehow get the money out of the bank and like hold it in my hands and I bought these two things right away. It was like unbelievable. Like, so, so it was answering to your question. It, it was even over my dreams. Like I couldn't dream like, I thought poker is gonna be like a, just a, have a little lunch money next to the to the to the university stuff. But yeah, after after a couple months, maybe six months, one year, then then I my expectations went up and definitely started to think, okay, I can get millions. And yeah, that didn't go that, like that. And I remember I, I started to, so like every, every young poker player who gets some money start to be like uh, not cautious and like not having any bankroll management. I remember my mom's uh, Toyota Yaris car. I was like uh, going for my friends, going to parties and I never asked for gas money. And I, I was feeling the gas in the gas station like, like this and didn't even look what's gonna be the price <laughs> and uh, every, time we, <laughs> every time we went for a dinner with my friends I was like guys I, I'm playing I get it I, I paint I, I get this um, and um, my, I had my big big first fall when when I lost my whole bankroll from my I think it's almost was almost like ten thousand dollars um, yeah, that was that was pretty much rock bottom. Um, <clears throat> I was playing uh, I was playing six max cash games from the beginning, basically. Uh, only this NL 10, 10 handed for a while, but after I swapped to six handed, uh, and uh, for some reason I started to play heads up with some guy. I thought he's a fish, and we played like two tables. And in my eyes, he played so bad. Uh, probably he was much better than me, but I thought he's like a fish. And I got so tilted and uh, sucked into the situation. I was like, if I lose all my money to this guy, I don't even care because he's such a big fish. I should win like so much. And yeah, eventually I just, I just lost everything. I don't even know how did I get all my money on one side but usually there was like one side I was playing and and have all my bankroll there and it was I think like three or four a.m in the morning when I I didn't have any money left and it was raining outside but I had to go for a run so I I was running 4 a.m in the rain and in the cold and I was thinking okay I I never want to have this feeling again I just have to rebuild it somehow and just, yeah, have to be careful about the bankroll management and everything. 
And since that, I, I got like very, I think very cautious. Some friends would say like, you are a bankroll meat and stuff like that, but yeah, I'm definitely not. But yeah, more cautious for sure. It's it's <clears throat> it's it's interesting. Do you think it like? Hmm. I can see this both positively and negatively impact the future of your poke career. For example, if I talk from my experience, I had a similar experience where due to going broke, probably twice or something, like at some point I was like, okay, fuck it. Higher stakes, for example, is not for me. I'll just keep on grinding low stakes. Um, did any any something similar like that happen to you where because you were now a bit more risk averse and kind of a bit traumatized by going broke, you could have maybe reached more success quicker, sooner, or do you think it actually helped you because you were just more cautious now and that was kind of the way forward for you? Um, I, I think I think it helped me because I, I never had like super high win rates at the beginning. So, so what you're what you're saying, I think it's very true for some players and it would slow, slow their uh, process. Uh, but I was actually playing even too high to my skills for a very long time. So what I mean, I remember I was playing like NL200 and I had like literally zero BP per 100, but I was just saying to myself, I just need bigger fishes. I'm just running bad. And I ended up playing like 1 million hand plus with the zero win rates, maybe rate back plus. Uh, so I was still, even if I was cautious with, with the bankroll management and, and stuff, I was definitely not good enough. And I, I, I always uh, chased the, the winnings uh, so I I was thinking about uh, I I don't have time for studying because I need to win money mm. and and I had a lot of expenses because um, I always try to help my family and uh, you know send my money to my mom pay my own uh, everything uh, so so basically I just uh, I just felt like I can win a lot by playing, but I can win by studying. And I, I studied, but not, not much. So in, the, in this case, it, it was uh, still not, uh, I was still not playing low enough to my, to my skill level, or I should have studied much, much more before. Uh, yeah, so, so I, I, so I can see it kind of protected you, right? Because you were maybe a little bit delusional of your skill. Whereas I think in my case, it was maybe even the opposite. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure like from whenever I remember, I would just never, never, never have a losing month or something. I would just always win, but I needed like more confirmation. So when that happened, like I had positive confirmation all the time, but I never really took it in as like, okay, this means that I'm a good poker player. But then when I went broke, it's like, yeah, you see, I already knew that this wasn't for me or something like that, you know? So I kind of used that going broke as more of a confirmation. You see, I should play it safe. Maybe this higher six is not for me, even though I was, I mean, I remember I was like probably like a hundred K in, in makeup and I grinded it all back playing like 200 or 400 an hour or something. <laughs> But it's like, and I grinded it back pretty quickly. So definitely, I should have just played a little bit higher. My my skill level was definitely uh, uh, definitely too high for the stakes that I was playing. I would say, Adam, do you do you feel like it on average would negatively impact you or positively impact you if you have like a downswing experience or like a going broke experience, almost like a traumatic experience early on in your career? Well, I think, like I said, it can go either way. I'm sure every poker player listening has their own traumatic experience of going through a downswing. I think generally you're going to learn the lesson of bankroll management to some degree. Do I need to be more risk cautious? 
And for a lot of players, it can leave scars. I think players who want to play high stakes, if you're trying to get high stakes quickly, it's probably going to negatively affect you because you're going to be more cautious and maybe not take risks when you want to. But a lot of players almost need to learn that lesson. They need to learn they're not invincible. They need to learn a downswing around the corner. So uh, it's hard to say, like, on average, is it good or bad? You guys are the polar opposite examples of yeah, a good it, example of it and a bad. It has to kind of calibrate your personality, I guess. Yeah, I guess if you're over risk, like taking too so much risk, it's going to balance that out a bit. If you're already quite risk averse and then you have a big downswing, maybe that's the kind of deciding factor that makes you mm. too risk averse. But I think learning as you go through your career, how much risk do you want to take on for your current situation? So if you're wanting to play at higher stakes, you're going to have to take on more risk. If you're wanting to play the current stakes and grind up a good win rate, you need to take on less risk. So yeah, I think it's just being very mindful of the experiences you're having and how they impact your opportunities in the future. If it makes you yeah, more cautious or yeah, limits you too much, that's going to be a problem. All right, loads to dive into from, from high side. So uh, yeah, you mentioned this downswing or this losing 10K at heads up. And then you said you went for a run at four in the morning. And then on that run, you decided never again. I'm curious to know uh, what thoughts went through your mind in that run and how you then transitioned that into making some changes to your approach to poker so you didn't go broke again. Yeah, I mean, the, the feeling was just so bad. Uh... I was so embarrassed by myself. Um, I just I, I couldn't even think about what can I what what I'm gonna say to to my poker friends to my mom. Like she was very skeptical first at poker, but when she she saw that I'm doing okay, she was kind of okay. Maybe maybe this could work out and. Uh, yeah, it was just um, like a, like a bad dream or something, and I just I just promised myself I, I just cannot do this again, and and I I knew what I have to do about it, and um, yeah, fortunately it worked, um, and um, I, I I think it it left a a big scar in me. Uh, and and then just basically I, I always wanted to avoid it uh, no matter what and that was like number one priority for sure <laughs> yeah i think sometimes we can learn a very valuable lesson very quickly like when you're a child and you touch a hot stove you don't need to touch it three times you touch it once you're like stove's hot don't touch it sometimes you almost go broke and you're like this is really bad for my future. I don't want to touch this again. So uh, we can make like big changes just from one big experience, especially if it's as painful as you're describing it, the shame, the annoyance at yourself, the heightened emotions. You've quickly went, right, I know what I shouldn't have been doing and how to move forward. So from here, you've lost a lot of your role. Talk us through like how you started to build your role and how you started to move up stakes. So we've got this kind of pivotal bad moment. You've had the run. You're not going to go broke again. Talk us through how you started your rebuild process and how you started climbing up stakes. Yeah, <laughs> the rebuild beginning of the rebuild process was funny because uh, me, a uh, friend of mine, and me decided that the easiest way to get back some bankroll is to go play live because it's so much easier. So I had a friend uh, from the university who actually get me into poker, like online poker. He was doing the quiz on poker strategy for me to get a $50 starting stack. And, and he, he was very supportive to me and said, okay, uh, obviously I told him what happened and he was like, yeah, just don't worry about it. Uh, just go grind. I give you some, some bankroll. I think he gave me like 3000 euros. And uh, so my other friend and me decided to go to Vienna, which was like, which is two hours drive from here and we played some live cash games like one two uh, and we were obviously we didn't have any I, he, he was in a similar situation and we didn't we didn't really have money to spend so we wanted to save some money and uh, so so like not pay hotels so we had like this perfect strategy we go like uh, 5 p.m and then we grind the whole day so we don't have to have an accommodation for the first night. And then second night we sleep in the car. We can 
manage one one night sleep in the car and then the third night we we sleep in a ibis like cheapest hotel possible so now we have a little rest and then we can go on and and play two nights in a row and then uh, so we had like a perfect plan for five days and um, well that didn't go very well so first of all it was like such a rake trap you we we play like one two the maximum buy-in was like 200 euros so you couldn't buy in deep and which was maybe a good thing for us and there was like mandatory um mandatory tip for the dealers because that was the payment and there were like huge rake like 15 percent and also a jackpot so like if you play a 15 euro pot it was like three four euros off immediately so i, I think i was losing like 1000 euros and uh, after day three and we were feeling miserable i remember a guy was a uh, high stakes player in Hungary and and I was sleeping in the car and waking up and eating like a yogurt or something and he's coming out with my friend and he's like oh hi oh guys you you live in this car what the hell are you doing and I was also very embarrassed and uh, I talked to my friend you know what I think this is a really bad idea I'm just losing money it's so much rake I think we should surrender and uh, I think that was like one of the best decisions. I, I don't even understand how could we do it, this decision in a bad state like that. Because usually I would say, okay, now it's, we just do it and whatever happens, it happens. But uh, I couldn't imagine if I'm not only broke, but owning my friend like 3,000 euros, what the hell I'm going to do? So uh, we, we went back and then... I think in the in the way back home, I decided, okay, there is one bulletproof solution. I think it's still very bulletproof and the best scenario you can you can do. If you study a lot and if you play on good tables and you do this all day, every day, it's basically impossible to to lose in the wrong, long run. Because we you you're gonna keep you you protect yourself and your win rate with good tables and you even if you are maybe let's say you're not winning on those tables but there are like big players or recreational players you probably win on those tables but then you keep studying um, so you basically protect yourself and and i think this approach actually worked for for almost 15 years I just had to play games where I'm plus EV and I have to keep, had to keep studying. And uh, yeah, it was a very, very long grind. I think it was like one or two years, but it was worth it. And, and uh, yeah, eventually, eventually I, I build up my own bankroll and I never had this issue again. Yeah, well, great story. So the rebuild <laughs> didn't get off to a fast start. But in the drive home, you came up with the, the winning formula, we'll call it. Studying a lot and playing good games. And you do that long enough, you're going to find a way to make money. Um, yes, yeah, so I think it's a real... Sometimes we need to have a bad experience or to go through things to realize what, what we're doing wrong and different approaches. For you, it felt like, although these are two experiences we went through, which were very painful, it feels like they've led to some clarity on what you need to be doing going forward. So, uh, yeah, I'm curious to know from this moment, you've, you're on the drive back, uh, you decided you want to study a lot and start getting good tables. Talk us through like when you started having some success. So we talked about the uh, kind of tough part of like struggling to have a bankroll. Talk us through when you started to uh, yeah get, get some success, make, move up stakes and start to go, how this thing is actually working and I can actually make a living from this game. Yeah, so after <clears throat> I, I definitely had like a long stretch of like very low win rates for a very long time. Uh, but I was still winning because I was playing a lot. I had break back and um, I just grinded a lot. And I, I studied always. So eventually I, I maybe I even dropped back some stakes and uh, scheduled more studying and stuff. And eventually uh, I 
I got much better and I, my win rate got higher and I was able to even go up and uh, and got some I also got got some coachings as well for sure I had back in the time Paul Otto internet he was very not well known um, cash game very very smart guy German guy I had a couple coachings with him and I just watched every single video I could find online and, and just uh, study what they do differently, what should I do, stuff like that. A um, lot of hand history reviews. Um, and yeah, it, it somehow it just started working and I was able to also split my role into different rooms. I played many, many rooms. I had times where I was like only into bum hunting to like have the highest win rate possible, but I don't want to wreck war at all. I just, I just want to win money. So I had a couple years of that too. And that was obviously very successful because I, I had much less uh, variance and I had, you know, I, I had like six, seven, eight poker rooms uh, up to NL 1K, 2K and was playing the best tables possible. And yeah, it was working finally. And then later uh, I started feeling, okay, I maybe I just want more and uh, I wanna, you know, be better than other wrecks too. I, and that was the this time where bomb hunters get a bad rep, obviously. And things got out of control. Like people were using scripts, people were doing bad behaviors, like, grimming all the time sitting out when when the recreational sits out so it was like very bad reputation from the big bum hunter guys and i i didn't want to do that either and i obviously always wanted to be like really good and and play against rex too and beat the regs and stuff so then then i started to play 300 400 as well uh 400 <clears throat> and uh, yeah, just just kept studying whatever I could study, and uh, and eventually it, it worked. <laughs> what was driving you throughout this? You mentioned wanting to get good, wanting to get better at the game. I'm curious to know what was the intrinsic motivation to want to keep studying, to want to keep doing better and improving. Mm, well, it was definitely. Um, I, I cannot say I was like, so, so if you ask a, like a prodigy poker player who they, they would say like they were never motivated by the money. They just wanted to play and, and the money follows. And I completely agree, but, but I was definitely more motivated by the money and, and winning money. And I, I remember I was, I was doing okay, but I had so much spending on my on my uh, flat on to my mom's uh, so so I, I wanted to to help my mom and and uh, she she wanted to sell our old house and move into a smaller one because it was expensive to to uh, pay by herself alone and I I didn't like change at all so I was motivated to to just pay the stuff and you know pay my stuff and everything and even help my sister sometimes so i always had this problem that i was doing okay but i couldn't build a bigger bankroll because i'm i'm spending a lot because of these issues so i had this brilliant idea 400 iq idea that i just have to win that much that even if i pay everything for my mom and sister it wouldn't cost anything like compared to the winnings. So that was my uh, <laughs> biggest motivation. And, and eventually I got that. And, and uh, finally I was able to, to build my bankroll because even if I, I was spending uh, like a thousand, two thousand dollars to these stuff, uh, compared to the winnings, it wasn't that big effect. And I was able to, so I, I got the pressure off and I was able to just 
accumulate money. I, I, I have a lot of friends who have the same problem. They say they are good winning money, but they winning exactly as much as they're spending and they cannot go forward. And if you think about it, it's kind of a um, mouse wheel or how do you say it? Uh, yeah, because, right. um, because uh, you cannot really afford to yourself to study more because you have exactly like 140 hours and you make your exact money you have, you're gonna spend. And basically, yeah, in, in, uh, you, you trapped a little bit. And I had the same issue, but then after I basically broke out and, and I had, okay, now I have much more time to study, much more time to play less tables, higher stakes, focus better on the decisions. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a very important topic to talk about building your bankroll and breaking out of that kind of that threshold where you're just making enough to survive. I'm sure lots of people listening can relate to this. I can picture this myself. Me, me and my friends went to Thailand to kind of help solve this problem. We wanted to live really cheaply, low cost, and to build our bankroll. And we were grinding full time every day for like nine months. And we did a bit of auditing with our money at the end, and we were dead broke right on the threshold. Another payment came out. And we're like, what the hell can we do to lower costs? So we looked at how much we have food, what our living costs were. And it very quickly became obvious that you can only squeeze your living costs so much. For you, obviously, you had your parents that you're paying for, other outgoings that might have been non-negotiable for you. But even like the, the things you have to pay for, rent, bills, come to a certain cost. And we remember sitting there going, the only option is to make more, like play higher. And it's one exactly. of those kind of realizations where you're like, if I keep <clears throat> making this much money, and then we start thinking, oh, what stakes do I need to play? How much hours do I need to play? What's the kind of threshold? So if you're playing 25 NL or 10 NL, you probably be on a, on a threshold. Once you get to 50s, 100s, there's, there's a breaking point where you get above. And when you're underwater, so to speak, and you're almost like in that survival state, you need to pay for the bills. It's really hard to think about what you actually want to achieve, what the future goals are, why you're playing this game, and really start to uh, tap into your full potential. So the first thing is, how do I build my bankroll? How do I get enough saved or... Uh, make enough money so that I can cover all my living costs and then have some spare. And as soon as you do that for a while, that compounding effect of that kind of extra profits builds more and more and more of a buffer. You can play higher games and there's like a compound effect. But yeah, I think your story was, I can definitely relate to that myself as well as being stuck where you're just making enough and all your living costs just take it all. And you're like, what am I doing with this game? How do I get going? So yeah, I think it's a, a good reminder to keep going to realize that the, the solution is often to often obviously lower cost if you can, but you're gonna have to make more money to get yourself yeah. above that threshold. Exactly. I, I wanted to do the same. Like I tried to, my, my first uh, uh, plan was just minimizing every cost, what I do or, or every payment and every spending, but this didn't work. It was still, a lot compared to the winnings and and the other option was just make more money <laughs> yeah i think like when you look at like in terms of exponential like improvements of the situation you can only like lower your spends by say 10 percent, 20 percent, maybe 30 percent, but you can increase your how much you're earning by double treble like 10x over time so uh, there's much more margin to to make more um but yeah obviously if you work on both simultaneously lower spends and then increase your income. Um, yeah, but I think it's a very important conversation, especially for anyone struggling to build a role. I know myself, I was so frustrated, like the first probably two years of poker, just how hard I felt I was working and then checking the bankroll at the end of the year going, still nothing. Is this still what you get for it? You still get peanuts for all this work? But this is a threshold <laughs> where you want to get above it. Like it, it compounds so quickly from that point. So uh, yeah, anyone who's listened to this struggling, keep it going, try to find that next opportunity to make more money and to increase your win rates. Hi guys, Rene aka The Wacko here with a quick Mechanics of Poker 2.0 announcement. In our program you will get access to 80 plus hours of content in which we will explain you all aspects needed in order to become a more successful poker player. Now one of these of course is the technical aspect of the game in which I'll be explaining you all the mechanics behind poker strategies. We'll be talking about GTO, exploitive play, with an extra focus on the why behind certain strategies and why the population has certain leaks. And to increase your win rate even further, we've recently added a river bluff and bluff catching section so you can increase your EV when those pots become very big. 
Our mindset and performance coach, Adam Carmichael, he took care of the mental game and performance section of this program in which he will teach you everything you need to know in order to break through limiting beliefs, better handle your emotions, break free from tilt, and play your A game more consistently. And last but not least, we've added the management and optimization section in the program in which we will give you various tips and tricks to make it more likely for your poker career to succeed and how to continuously improve as a poker player. Now on top of that, this concept is continuously evolving based on feedback and suggestions we get from our community. Next to all this content, you will have access to our exclusive Discord community, monthly live Q&A calls, and one-on-one -on -one coaching session in which we are going to be reviewing if you have been implementing the stuff that we teach you in the mechanics of poker correctly. So do you think you have what it takes to master the mechanics of poker? Go over to mechanicsofpoker.com and maybe you will get a chance to work with me and Adam and make more progress in your poker career. But for now, without further ado, let's get back into more goodness in today's episode. So I want to transition the conversation a little bit to uh, science. And you mentioned you're a hardcore science nerd at heart, and you love data and data-oriented thinking. Uh, so I'm curious to know what forms of science you think are useful for maybe a general mindset, which is helpful for poker players. So what are some of the sciences that you've found interesting or data-oriented thinking that you found helpful? Yeah, uh, I think definitely critical thinking is very, very good and important. Um, I'm actually not sure about a, a few stuff because uh, I, I was always thinking critically and uh, I, I thought it's because of poker, because poker needs, you know, you have to get the facts straight and right and you have to get the, the strategies right and always thought about okay, I probably think like this because of poker. But then I met a lot of successful poker players who were really not critically thinking and, and uh, maybe even think in my eyes, believe in stupid stuff. And uh, they were still very successful. And uh, I realized that I was probably thinking like this before poker. Uh, I'm not sure why. Maybe I was always like real, um, like how do you say, like real stuff, real oriented, like in the subjects, so like mathematics, informatics stuff. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I think it it um, also helped in poker, and poker helped in the thinking as well, because I always had to search for the for the right material and the right uh, uh, videos and, and coaching uh, uh, material. Yeah, I was going to say, I think a scientific mind generally helps for poker because, like, as you mentioned, critical thinking, which is generally, if you think of what science is, it's having a hypothesis of what is right or what's the right way to act, behave, whatever it is, and then testing that and then getting data to back up that kind of assumption. And over time, science correlates to, uh, to data points, and that data point mm -hmm. shows this works out more often, this works out less often. And if we don't use some sort of scientific thinking, we very often get swayed by small samples, but that's our own experience. We go, this worked for me, and you go, okay, great, that worked for you, but it doesn't really uh, show that that's a winning strategy or a winning way to approach things. So I think the scientific critical thinking way is always like trying to think of the data points. How much data correlates to uh, to this? And can I test this hypothesis? And I even think of my, my book career started with a bit of a, a science experiment. It was almost like, let's go to Thailand, and in three months, we're going to see if we can make money playing poker. Let's, let's go. We're at N equals one experiments. Let's go there. If it works out, we, we keep going. If it doesn't, we're back to tell our friends in the pub how much of an idiot we are, but we don't know. It's like testing a hypothesis. I think this could work. Let's get some data on it. Let's build a sample size, and then let's like kind of um, get, yeah, get a bit of 
data on that to, to look back on. So uh, another thing you've mentioned, which I really want to dive into, uh, you said you're obsessed with survivorship bias, which I think really ties well to this topic in terms of selection bias. I, I class survivorship bias as we see that the kind of top of the pyramids, like people are successful, and we forget all the kind of data points underneath, the people who haven't failed. So a good example is you look at all the startup businesses and you look at all the billion dollar companies, you forget there's like a thousand exactly. companies that failed on a similar startup venture and you only see the top one. You go, that was a great idea, but you forget below this. Now you've mentioned you think survivorship bias is very important for poker players to understand. So I'm curious to know for you how you've used that kind of uh, hypothesis and how you feel it's a useful skill for poker players to learn about. Yeah, so I, I always got frustrated by, so I, I was playing MTTs as well, live and online too. And boy, the swings you can have there is insane. And especially live where you play, even if you play the whole Vegas series, you, you're going to play like a couple thousand hands. It doesn't mean basically anything. And you can, you can run bad for your lifetime playing live tournaments. Probably you're not gonna, if you're good, probably you're not gonna like losing money, but easily you're never gonna have a big score and the, it's really dependent on your big scores. And I, I never liked when people had like a God run, hot run series and they were like justifying everything with that. Uh, I can give you a, so ridiculous example. So there was a friend of mine I started playing poker with uh, on the university I already mentioned. And he was he was on a heater. He, he won a tournament online and then we went to the live series and he won a tournament there. And he actually said to me that now I feel if I really focused on a tournament, I can win it. Like he genuinely believed this, that he, if he focused enough, he can win a tournament. Like what? So so people can be uh, delusional with this so so hard. And uh, there was always, you know, it, it's very weird in poker when you have friends and you root for them, but they run insanely hot and you just don't run good and obviously you're happy for your friend and it's much better than someone else winning it but you have this weird feeling that you oh maybe i deserve it he doesn't deserve it and obviously every single poker player thinks he's the unluckiest poker player alive that's just the way how we feel about poker but uh, i think i was i also predicted some friends that if you do this or do that, you're gonna be broke. And they went broke and they didn't listen. So they got cut with the result oriented thinking. And yeah, it's poker, it's it's so weird in poker, the feelings when you when you get a 25% pot bet on the river and you have to be good like one out of five times, it's impossible to to relate on your feelings because you're going to lose the, even if people bluff enough and probably they do, you're going to lose most of the time. So uh, the normal learning process is you do something, you, you have a feedback, it's wrong or right, and you improve yourself. But in poker, it's all messed up because so many times you get a feedback, which is inaccurate or maybe even wrong and you think you did the right thing but you did wrong and the opposite is well as true so it's really hard to truly realize when you learn something in poker and it works and we had this idea with another poker player that it, maybe not now all these solvers you can you can see the strategies and justify but what is right and what is wrong, but in the in the previous area, you could you could even run bad with your strategy choices. So let's say you think, okay, I think people just overfold to overbet. Let me try, and then you run into nuts three times in a row, 
<laughs> you just don't want to try again. I, I lost three buying. And maybe that was the perfect strategy against the field and you would make a lot of money. But you just had a bad run and you think it's not working. And it wasn't possible to check it with a solver or with mass data analysis or anything like that. So, so you would just drop it. And maybe uh, some other player would do the same as you, but work every time. And then he keeps this strategy and turns out it's the best strategy against the food. So he's like crushing, crushing the games. So it's so, so complicated and you have to be really careful. And I have, uh, I know a lot of poker player who I would consider like geniuses. I, I just don't understand how they know what they cannot even explain it. And five years later, you check in the solver and you realize that it's working because of that. And you tell them, did you know that your stuff is working because of that? And it, I, I, I didn't know that. I just, I just did it and it worked. Mm. Yeah, so how do we navigate these false feedback loops? So as you mentioned, like in poker, a lot of the time you can make the kind of correct player, but not get rewarded, but actually get punished in the short term, losing pots. I think feedback works best when it's direct. If you do a good action, you get a good reward. If you get a, do a bad action, you get punished. But poker just doesn't work that way at all. It's, if anything, it's like asymmetric returns where you only need to be right a portion of the time. And as you mentioned as well, sometimes you can be right, but just get get a, get a punished, like a, a bluffing spot where you run into the top of his range. So uh, with that in mind, how do we learn to handle that better? Because poker is not going to change anytime soon. We're all constantly in these spots where we're getting kind of false feedback and it's playing on our emotions, playing on our insecurities. How do players learn to uh, deal with these false feedback loops? Yeah, I think it, it got easier over time because if, um, if I come up with my own example, I played so many hands, uh, I'm not sure, but probably close to between five and 10 million hands in my lifetime. So maybe even more, I'm not sure. So basically you, you can have a huge database and uh, I think you just have to understand that you don't care about your feelings. Like your feelings not gonna be the, the guide in this game. Uh, may, maybe intuition when you have a strategy and, and intuition works for sure, but just feelings, uh, it just, you cannot rely on them. And basically I think what you should do is you can study the spot in checking a solver and try to, you know, even node lock or just uh think about how the players would play and it would work with the uh, the properties you gave and also you can just have to use data and you have to prove like a friend of mine showing me a hand and he said lie you look at this call how good this call is and he's winning and i'm like okay yeah uh this this is a nice hand but can you prove it like, can you, we can, we can check in a solver and you can say that they would not play like this. You can see the bluffing hands and you would say like, they bluffing much more because you can clearly see that uh, these hands are not bluffed. Uh, and that's some kind of proof, but probably not enough. And you can also check your database and see if people truly bluff enough these spots or do that or do that and yeah i think now it's much easier but five ten years ago it was so much difficult because you you couldn't be even sure like how, how could you know you you just had to talk with all the players and have a conclusion what works and what is not working mm. Yeah, I like that. You said data over feelings. I think that's a very good way to phrase it. And as you mentioned, now we can look at the data and also look at like solvers and how they play. And we can see not only what the data looks like, but also what that would mean about the strategy. In the past, you might have had the data from our hand histories or poker tracker, and we still had to make assumptions about the data. It's like, oh, this data is this number. That means now we've got the whole yeah. strategy kind of out in the open. And I think it's understanding that like feelings are subjective, which means we have our own individual uh, what we think about stuff, whereas data is objective. 
which means it is what it is. You can't argue with data. You can manipulate data, I guess, but it exactly. doesn't lie. So if you learn to look at data as a kind of <clears throat> almost like a, an acid test, they call it, where basically it's, this is the kind of thing I'm going to test against, and then do your feelings validate the data or do they go against the data? And as you mentioned, like, I like what you said to your friend, like, do, can you prove it? Can you prove it's a really good way of going, show me the data, show me the data. I don't know your feelings, but show me the data. And if they can't show you any data, they might be able to show you 20 hands or 20 experiences we had. And even then the conversation then goes, oh, do you realize the sample size you're using is quite small? You're telling me that your feelings this way, but we haven't got enough data to, to know that yet. And then I think educating people on, yeah, kind of sample sizes and what data is important. So. Uh, yeah, for you, in terms of how you've been able to use data, you mentioned as you've kind of evolved in poker and how solvers become more apparent, how has your use of data uh, become more efficient or helped you more? As you've built your sample from zero hands to 10 million hands, how, have, how has the data over feelings helped you to uh, kind of navigate your poker career? Okay. <clears throat> so, um, hmm. Well, um, definitely the, over the years, I, I got better at this. And um, also everybody got better at this and had better videos about it and better softwares like hand to note. You can do range research on your field. Uh, just basically have more hands. Um, and it, it's funny because it's, it was definitely one of my mistakes um, that every time a new software came out, I was hesitant to spend money on the software and not use it. And every time I delayed something that I don't need that, it's just, you know, uh, uh, I, I realized that I should have bought it sooner. <laughs> So it, it was like consistent during my career. That definitely was one of my biggest mistakes that uh, something new came out, I didn't hop on the train soon enough. Obviously there was the other side when I had friends who bought everything, every course, every solar, everything, and they never used it, never watched it. Uh, and obviously that's the other, other side of the, a spectrum and you don't want to do that but usually technology science and and softwares are so much better than than just human powers and uh, you just it's it's very useful to to use them and also i had a similar experience in my team working abilities so like poker is is a strange sport because you think you're playing alone and you're like a lone warrior and i always felt like it i do much better if i study alone i uh, i was secretive with my strategies my ideas i was worried about it's gonna be you know stolen and everybody gonna do this little trick i knew obviously i had a few friends we were sharing strategies with but it's it's always turned out to be false. And when I was open about my strategies and everything with another guy and, and we were started to working together, it was always so much better for me. And I realized that it's just, it's even if it looks like a, um, uh, like not a team sport, it, it's definitely a team sport especially now when you it's just impossible to figure out everything by your own and um, you just you just have to be open and uh, study with others and you it's usually it's gonna benefit you more than than you think it would hurt you and also i had um, so so always th this coaching topic is difficult too because uh, there are a lot of coaches, they stopped playing and they couldn't win anymore. And they just, you know, the classic saying, if you can do it, just uh, coach it. And, uh, uh, and, and there are other coaches which are like probably good, but like super, super expensive. Like if, you, if you're gonna spend $1,000 for one hour coaching, it's 
it's really, really hard to get the the stuff out of one hour and uh, obviously the coaching for profit is much different and maybe maybe it's a better construction uh, but then i realized uh, that uh, there are coaches who are not playing competitively competitively anymore uh, but they are super smart and i had uh, my coach from Run It Once, uh, Tyler Forrester, for for some time, and I mean he was just so smart with some stuff. I would never ever uh, come up with that by myself. Uh, so even he he wasn't competitively playing high stakes uh, when I was playing them. I I learned so much stuff from him and, and his coachings because uh, he was way smarter in other areas than me. And yeah, that was a good realization in all of these three categories, like you shouldn't spare your money when there's a good product which could help your game. You should work with others for sure. You don't have to be secretive. Maybe if you're the one and only genius and you are on the top already maybe it's just can hurt you but usually usually you just gonna gain something from it and also with coaching i was very skeptical and i think being critical and skeptical is a good thing but you just have to be able to change your mind and and have to be i, I definitely had coachings i didn't like and i was i felt i spew money on it but but on the other hand, I I just found stuff which I would never figure out my, by myself. It's just people. So many people think different way on the game about the game and different areas, and yeah, you never know what what you can learn. Mm. Yeah, new perspectives. I think you can't really. Uh put a price on how much they're worth to you in certain avenues and you mentioned kind of three vehicles which i'm i'm curious to know more about in terms of how they're related to you and other people as well because you mentioned like say software new software new technologies with well, hansen or g2 wizards you mentioned working with others and you mentioned taking on coaches i'm sure a lot of people can relate to uh, thinking either or all of those avenues would be helpful but they feel resistance they feel like oh yeah i kind of want to do that but they, they find a reason not to as you mentioned new te technology comes out or a new software and you go uh ah, could be good but I'll, I'll just wait for a while and then six months later you're like all right i need to use this so um why do you feel as humans or yourself as an individual are averse to uh, taking on new things especially if it could be uh, a kind of door opener to uh, a high win rate or a uh, new potential uh, for me, it's definitely a, a back and forth kind of game. So I would say, um, first I was like, okay, let's buy any coaching I can get because it's so good. And then you burn yourself with something you think it wasn't worth it. And maybe you get, you feel you, you got scammed or something. And then you are oh, ne never getting coaching again, especially a guy is not playing competitively and I'm not going to ever get the coaching by that or, or not, not playing, even not playing poker. And then uh, it's, I, I think for me, it was really hard to come out of that, uh, that uh, dig, if you could say that, uh, because you got burned and it's hard to change your mind. But then, you know, I, I spoke with, a lot of friends and they said oh i tried this coach and he was amazing he said this and that and it's so good and then eventually i okay let's let's give it a try and it turned out oh oh my god i i didn't even know about that and also the same as i mentioned before with the with the giving value and not expecting so you can you there are coaches you you start coaching at 2 p.m. and 2:59 he's like okay wrap it up we're done one hour is done pay me stuff like that and uh, other coaches is like okay when when we finish this topic we finish the coaching guy um, and they don't calculate like 60 minutes uh, 
I, I did coaching myself too. And uh, often I had like one hour, 20 minutes, something like that. I, I didn't feel the need to just finish right away. So, so you, you can have this vibe when somebody is truly wants you to help you and coach you. And it's not really motivated by only money. I think I saw a good Phil Garfield video recently when he explained about this, that it's probably better to have a coach who is like not the best, but uh, he's, uh, he's passionate about helping you and about the strategies and stuff like that rather than having the best player in the world, but he just, okay, yeah, give me five grand and I give you some coachings, but actually he's gonna be like secretive and didn't show up in time, doesn't show up in time, doesn't care about your, uh, you, you send a couple of hand histories and he's like, okay, we talk about it if you buy a coaching or something. Uh, so you, you, you can be, um, you can be more assured someone is gonna gonna care about you and it it helps with the with this process i think and helps changing changing your mind as you mentioned going into a coaching arrangement is a bit like going to a relationship you've got to like each other you've both got to be invested they've got to be able to communicate well with you and the best player in the world isn't necessarily the best coach i think always for finding a coach Very you've true. got to find the person who resonates with you like there's a lot of free content out there these days you can generally get hours of thinking from the person you want to work with before you go into a coaching relationship you've got to be able to resonate with them you've got to communicate in a way you understand or give perspectives that you can take on board and not be like a, a robot who's very smart but might not be able to relate i think you mentioned like having a some smart players who are really good but they can't explain their strategy then five years later the solver shows them what they do but they're like hmm, i didn't even know i was doing that so i need to find that balance between someone who's invested in you and someone who uh yeah, can explain things in a way that is usable for you. So uh, for you, I'm curious to know um, of the habits you've developed and the routines you've established over the years, which have been the biggest game changers for you in terms of increasing your performance? Well, that's a, that's a very good question because I, I think I, I tried everything you can try. Like I had the craziest morning routines. Um, I, I was trying everything. Uh, I can read about uh, <clears throat> and uh, I, I definitely I'm not sure if you guys had this but uh, when I had a huge list of morning routines and I ended up feeling that I'm just doing endless stuff and I never get to work and never get to do stuff done so and I'm definitely still battling with this one of that is uh, meditation I I was I was doing meditation and I was a meditation skeptic because I didn't feel like it helps and I'm I'm trying to do meditation again. I still don't have a, a final answer, but um, um, so I, I love challenges. I um, I think when you have something. Um, like over you, like you, I mean, a higher power basically. So if you, what, what I usually do is I give a free, free role to a friend. Like last time it was, it was Benjamin Charlotte, he's a good French poker player living in Budapest, a good friend of mine. And I told him, okay, Benji, I wanna do this for one month. I gave the rules and if I don't complete, I give you, uh, $2,000 uh, punishment fee and you have to give it to the charity of your choice. And what I accomplished with this is I took off the responsibility from me. Like if I would give you an example, uh, if I eat too much uh, sweet stuff like chocolate, desserts, everything, I'm pretty sweet too. So it's hard to resist. So I always have this, uh, I'm grinding and I'm like, oh, I could use like a Snickers bar or something. And then, yeah, yeah, but I shouldn't get that. It's, it's not healthy, whatever. So I have this constant debate in my, and, and it's getting my uh, willpower 
But if I have a challenge like this, I know I just cannot do it because it would cost two thousand dollars. So it's so easy. You you start. You don't even think about it anymore because you can. And um, I think it's a really good way of thinking that um, sometimes you cannot trust even yourself, and it's better to just source it out, and uh, and you perform much better. So. Um, I had, uh, I, I, I cannot say if I, I, if I would say a game changer, that's, that's quite of a game changer, but I cannot do challenges every single week and month. And uh, I can obviously feel when one challenge ends and, and obviously if I would start another challenge, it wouldn't be the, the, as um, powerful as before because that, uh, that's the reason why you take a challenge. Um, and uh, I, I had a lot of morning routines and doing a lot of stuff, but I never felt uh, anything like a big game changer. There were stuff which helped me a lot. So like, like fasting, I think helped me a lot, but not because fasting is some special thing. I mean, you could argue that it's good for longevity and yeah probably uh, there is debate on that but for me what works with it is just just the window that okay after 9 p.m i don't eat i don't have to worry about eating and you know i i know i cannot eat so it takes off the same takes off the pressure and um, it's just much better to create uh, frameworks around your your uh, work environment and your life and uh, it's easier less less thing to worry about and uh, i think the same with poker i try to do like uh, i love these try time frames like pomodoro or one and a half hour sessions i like love these sessions and rest and and standing and walking and so i love these uh, block giving blocks to your day uh, like a schedule uh, and uh, i think it was useful i i try to study all the time uh, these sessions like every day one one and a half hour sessions like in blocks but also if i found find something which is very very useful and i can't wait to use it in in real games then i just forget about the the time frame and the pomodoro it rings but i just continue because i'm so involved so i love that because that means uh, i'm just i just got so interested in the stuff i just want to get to the bottom of it and uh, learn it well uh, but as a starter i think it's really good to you know have these blocks and and have you uh, for example, my my grind is is the best when I if I wake up and I have a cup of coffee, I feel like so motivated and so focused. That's like my golden hour, and I would love to grind all the time like that. But the problem is, you cannot really find good games all the time when you wake up wake up unless you live in Bali, for example, and you wake up five a.m. and you just jump into the cash game actions. So I don't have the best time zone for that, um, but I can use my time differently. And I wake up and I have the coffee and golden hour. I probably use it for studying or for exercise, gym or tennis or something like that. And obviously, definitely the exercise is awesome for, for playing because you just Think better. It's much better to, you know, you have your exercise. You you feel a little bit tired, but again, you can you can overdo it. And I'm sure you felt it too. If you have like a sickest leg workout, it's much harder to to focus on poker. So it always comes with a cost. And um, I think you can have like a good balance. Um, and uh, yeah, usually, usually these things, I mean, it's pretty basic, but 
I don't think there is so many stuff which is like the the best game changer. You just have to be balanced and consistent, and it could be very boring to do the same things every day. Mm -hmm. uh, but that could just work best. Yeah, I like the process you went through. And as you mentioned, for you, there's no uh, thing that jumps out as like a, a big game changer as such. But there's lots of little things you do that you found that works for you. So you mentioned fasting, which I class as like a simplified strategy for dieting. You think <laughs> we all need to eat two or three meals. You need to figure out the strategy for eating. So if you simplify the strategy, eat in a shorter window, you're going to make less mistakes. And it's easier to stick to, harder to overeat if you're someone who's uh, struggling with weight. Yeah. You mentioned having these kind of study blocks and blocking out time. I can relate to that as well. If I have a six hour window to be productive, very hard for me to be fully efficient. But if I have a 90 minute window where I'm studying a very specific thing, much easier for my mind to commit to that. And you mentioned as well, like you've got lots of interests. I'm sure if you had, if you didn't create structure, your mind would drift to lots of different things. So creating these kind of blocks of time to work in different things is useful for you in particular. And then you mentioned this kind of golden hour in the morning. Ideally you would grind, but if not, you'll study, do exercise and using that. I think it's just as every individual, we've got to figure out what kind of routine would work for us based on what we're trying to get out of ourselves in that day. If you're trying to get six hours of grinding or three hours of studying, how does that fit in your day? And what do you need to do around that behavior wise to make sure you're efficient, you're feeling great when you want to during those times. And as you mentioned, you might not be able to align it fully with a grinding schedule for your alertness, for example, but you can definitely use that time proactively to, uh, to optimize your day. It sounds like you've done a, a lot of trial and error. I've, I myself as well had many elaborate morning routines that needed simplified over time. But sometimes you've got to try a lot of things to realize what actually works. For me, meditation's an, a, a game changer. Going outside, getting uh, fresh air, morning sun exposure, um, and hydration. Hydration with water and salts. They're big for me in terms of how I feel in the first 30 to 60 minutes of the day, but they're not magic bullets either. They're, they're personal to me that work, but yeah, finding that kind of cocktail is very, very important. So um, I want to talk a little bit about risk. And we've talked earlier how uh, you had experiences of almost going broke early in your career, or at least in the rock bottom, and how that was impacting you in terms of not wanting to go there again. I'm curious to know, as you moved up to higher stakes and the money started to get very significant in terms of the, what your lifestyle and things it could affect, how were you approaching taking risk? So let's use an example when you were maybe sh shooting, shot taking one case, moving from 500 to one case. What was your kind of bankroll management approach during this phase? And what was your approach to risk? Were you someone who was thinking calculated in terms of if I play higher, I make more money, let's go for it. Did you have any protocols in place? And how were you uh, assessing risk as you were moving up stakes <clears throat> in your career? Yeah, I, I tried everything. <laughs> I can try, and uh, obviously about uh, after this uh, bankroll bankrupt incident, I was uh, much more careful, and I always thought about like okay, hundred buying bankroll management stuff like that. But actually, uh, I think it's much more reasonable to just be uh, aggressive when you have a good win rate and uh, if if i i mean i see players who like crush the limit 10 bv per 100 maybe not 10 these years but very hard crash the limits and they just don't go up and yeah i mean i could understand why they're doing this but um, it's just obvious you're gonna move up maybe you have a little slightly lower win rate, but you're gonna pay less rate and you're just gonna earn more money. So I would definitely recommend uh, <clears throat> a win rate based bankroll management and not like it doesn't really say anything if you have a hundred binds or 20 binds. I, I would not recommend to 10 buying shot a stake or something, <laughs> but, uh, but you definitely can be more aggressive with your win rate. I didn't have this problem because usually I had lower win rates uh, early on my career. Career, so uh, I just I, I rather had to move down than up and uh, improve myself and have better win rates. Mm, but then, yeah, when when I had better win rates, I I just moved up, uh, even not having like fifty plus or hundred plus. Uh, win rates uh, <clears throat> but also 
I definitely can uh, feel the age. And uh, now I have a wife and we're expecting a child and it hits much differently than uh, it was 10 years ago. You, it, it, the, the dancing hurts more for sure. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure you can relate. And uh, now I, I just rather have uh, consistent and uh, less uh, money variance like even if the win rate is good uh, maybe not gonna take a shot uh, one stake or just you know sell some action stuff like that uh, I try to avoid big variance now uh, I, I got a little, little bit more uh, careful about that and yeah I think it's normal when when you get older and and the uh, the, the things are so much different. Mm. Yeah, I think as you're younger, you can take on more risk. One, you haven't got as much to risk in general, but also you've got a lot of time to recover and the consequences yeah. of, say, exactly. going broke are a lot, a lot less. Like if, when I was in my early 20s, I wouldn't have mind sleeping on a sofa for a year if I needed to, to get myself on my feet. Now I'm like, do I really want to sacrifice my current life to, uh, to grind it back up? And then as you mentioned, like responsibilities increase as well. And you go through a, from one to acquire, 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 to wanting to protect. Obviously you want to acquire as well, but you want to protect what you've got. You put a lot of time, energy into what you've got. And it's a little bit reckless if you want to put it all on the line in some high stakes games <laughs> and go back to, uh, back to the start again. But yeah, some people do play the high risk life game. So fair play to them if you want to. So for you in terms of uh, your approach to actually taking a shot take, did you, uh, you mentioned win rate was really good. You mentioned always studying and you mentioned good game selection. Were you the kind of guy who would wait for good games and kind of shot take slowly? Or would you go, right, my win rates are good. I'm going for that game now. And you were quite relentless and you just played that game somewhat full time. Uh, I, I always was like everything I was back and forth and tried uh, every kind uh, of that. Um, I, I usually, if I, if I, I, I try to maximize the, the good games and if I found a good game, I jumped in and, and I tried to stay in the game as long as possible. Now, uh, my, maybe I would prioritize my sleep and uh, my, you know, my schedule, but obviously there would be uh, exceptions. Um, uh, and also it, it's, I think it's very difficult with poker because sometimes you think you are in a really plus EV game and then you realize you're not. And uh, this can change over the years pretty dramatically. For example, we have this GG break, uh, you know, um, boycott when people didn't play. And we, in the, in the community, we shared a lot of rake uh, schemes, like how much rake we play, pay, how much rake you can, by how, how, how good win rate you could have, like this table and that table. And even I was very careful. I didn't realize that, oh my God, I, I have played so many bad minus EV games. And people tend to overestimate the win rate. They overestimate the, the recreational player loss rate or even your, um, your position. So we were started to try to make some Excel sheets and calculate over data that um, how much you can win if the recreational on your left and how much you can win if the recreational on your right and how much is the rake. So we had these sheets calculating this and we were very shocked that, yeah, some, some tables were just drawing that and you shouldn't play them. So even I consider myself, I was very cautious and a good game selector. I still had this problem and, and many players have this problem and they didn't even know. So it, it had to evolve every, over the time, almost every year. And um, yeah, just, just have better under, understanding about the game and the rake and the, and the situation. And that, that could, that, that helped a lot. For sure. 
Do you think in the modern world of online poker, it's kind of necessity for players to go for that process, to understand then how beatable the games are, how much the rake is, where the edge comes from? Do you feel like at more stakes, let's say mid to high stakes, most players should be going for this process to figure out how probably games are? Um, yeah, I think, I think uh, most players have to do this in, in some degree because definitely there are some super great players who are just very, very smart and improve themselves so quickly. But I mean, you have to understand that the money basically comes from the from the recreationals and uh, if if there is like six regulars it's very very hard and everybody's gonna overestimate their skill so it's it's really hard especially if you if you play in a high rate environment it just uh, you know some say you should play with the best and and that's how you improve but i don't think you have to play with them and lose your money to them to, to improve. Uh, it's, I think it's better if you get prepared and, and uh, study otherwise. Like, I, I think, yeah, you should play like, if you, if you wanna hold lobbies and you wanna play three-handed, obviously you have to play and maybe you're gonna be minus EV and it's a good practice, but you, you just cannot know if how long how long it's gonna take and how it's it's not a good strategy to play one year while you minus EV and, and I think a lot of players, even very, very smart players and high stakes players nowadays get almost broke because of this mentality. And they think uh, I mean it's just it's just not infinite places in the highest in in, in the in the among the best players like it's not not like you can have uh, 100 best players in the top like it's, it's finite finite places and maybe you're gonna make it maybe you're not gonna make it but you cannot count that um, anybody just can jump on the train and, and you know just be there and win as much as they win because there is always other competition. They always other players and new players coming up and somebody's gonna. So if, if you think about a six max table, like it's six spots and not everybody's gonna win. So the, as you know, the usual saying that if the six best players play together, some of them are still gonna losing even if it's the sixth best player. And it's it's very true. It's I, I see uh, coaching uh, and coaching for profit advertisement that we make you this winning player. You're gonna win like this much and that much. And I mean, you you cannot say that because I mean it's just finite place where people can win that much money, and you might not get into that <clears throat> even if yeah, you try very to... hard. Yeah, poker is like a, a finite game where there's winners and losers. For you to win, someone must lose. If six guys are at a table, you can't all be the winner at that table. So it just comes down to uh, understand the games you're playing. And it comes back to your, your simple formula from early in your career, where you mentioned winning poker strategy is studying a lot and playing good games. And the good games part is a very uh, diverse variable, especially with the, the modern games and the way rakes calculated and stuff like that players need to be a lot more careful with what they class as good games and to be mindful that maybe the games they're playing aren't as good as they thought, especially if their win rates over long samples aren't correlated. And as you mentioned, it's not as simple as many players might think. And as you, you mentioned that you had to do a, a lot of work with a, a peer group to uh, come to conclusions about how profitable games were. So uh, yeah, I'm sure some players will, will go away and start thinking about the games they're playing. So Renan, for yourself, how has your approach to uh, game selection changed over the years? Do you feel like it's harder now to find good games? And yeah, what's your kind of approach to game selection? No, I would say it's uh, it's still the same. I would also say your definition of a good game really depends on your evolution as a player. Like especially when I was at the peak of my career, people usually said I had very bad game selection, whereas I felt actually I had good game selection. I was battling a lot. But that didn't mean that I had bad game selection. I was not battling Linus all the time. You know, that would be bad game selection. But I was picking on which were, in my opinion, the weaker racks who were willing to battle. 
So I always had a form of game selection. Um, yeah, it just maybe looked different for a pure bum hunter looking in. If I'm battling three, four handed, they say you have no game selection, but I clearly did have game selection and I would be smart when I would play someone, in which position I would play someone, which stake I would play someone. For example, I knew that there were some guys that when I would start, I know that they would be at the end of their session. I would always pick, I would battle those guys because they've been playing for six hours. I just came in fresh. So I backed myself coming in fresh against someone who's already been playing for six hours. So these are like, it's broader than, oh, you should play in a game with a fish. Okay. And even yeah. I think, I think Los also said that like, you have ranges of fish. Like it's, in my opinion, it's better to play in a three or four handed game with a potential good seat on a future fish, for example, then I see some tables run with like a semi fish who maybe lose like minus 10 BB and you're sitting across. It's like, that's probably going to be a more minus EV table in the long run than if you just start a new three, four handed game with like a, a potential of a whale coming in, et cetera, et cetera. So game selection is broader than just you should play with fish. In my opinion, I, I think I, I want to want to add that to the whole game selection story. I also wanted to add actually something to uh, the morning routine story. I could definitely relate to sometimes it's actually the same with like a pre session. Like you can sometimes have too much things and it kind of loses its purpose, right? If you just make a whole list of pre session stuff and you go into your session like, wait, what, 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 what was I supposed to do again? It kind of surpasses the purpose of you want to just put your brain in the right position in order to perform. And it's the same with morning routines. I think the, the, the main takeaway that I got from morning routines, I remember I read the book from Hal Elrod, The Miracle Morning, which was actually like the first self-development book that I've ever, 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 uh, ever read. And it was more the holistic idea of, wait, I have influence on my performance or if i do certain things i will feel better and if i do other things i will feel worse it was more like that holistic approach than necessarily i think he said you had to read you had to meditate and you had to do some form of exercise i think that was like hell elrod's uh uh criteria and i did that in the beginning but then it became a bigger picture so oh wait the food that i put into my body have an influence on how my brain feels right some foods make your brain foggy other foods make your brain not foggy well, maybe if I'm supposed to perform, I should eat something that doesn't make my brain foggy, right? So it was more more that that I thought that was very helpful for me. Meditation or like breathing exercises, cold showers, all these type of things I found very useful, especially like pre-session. So usually before I play, I do something like some Wim Hof breathing, cold shower, meditation to like quiet my mind. I notice a huge difference in the quality of my decisions Be in my session, if I do it or if I don't do it. And especially nowadays, if I if I want to get into a session, I'm like, oh, I don't want to do a 15-minute meditation. And it's kind of the saying, I think, right? If you don't have time for a 15-minute meditation, you should sit down for 30. That's exactly like, I know that if I go yeah. in rushed, like, oh man, I, I, I just, I just if I have that feeling, I know I have to just sit down, even though I really don't want to. It's more of a more of a uh, alert to myself that I should actually sit down because if I would now start playing, I would feel rushed. And what I then notice, I start rushing action. I want certain things or I start to play very fancy. I make a spew or something like that. So I notice, like for me, like just quieting myself down before a session is 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 very key. I also liked what you guys talked about um, eliminating decisions, right? To prevent decision-making fatigue, but also the fact that your willpower is not endless. Uh, I actually experienced this. I was playing, nowadays I don't play that much anymore, but I was playing last week and suddenly my wife called and she said, oh, I'm having here, I'm having, we're having some drinks with some friends. Do you want to come over? And I was in, I have good games. It was, I think, Friday night European time. I was like, huh. In the past, when I was clearly just focused, okay, I want to become the best, I already made that decision. Like someone could call me and say, what do you mean? I'm here on my purpose. You know, I'm trying to become the best poker player possible. I'm not going to stop within three hours because that's what I said I was going to do. So there was no decision. Now I was like, should I go? But games are good. But do I so really true. care that games are good because it's not really anymore <laughs> my goal? Is my social life more important? You understand? And now suddenly I had a decision. So I was like, should I stop? Should I not stop? I stopped. Then I continued, then I stopped again. <laughs> it was a mess. Whereas in the past, you know, if you have your decision made up before, it's so much easier, right? Like what, what you said with fasting, oh, I don't eat, so there's no question. Or with your Snickers bar, I have a bat, I'm not going to eat a Snickers bar. So I would say 
making your decisions beforehand, right? And aligned with knowing what 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 kind of purpose you're currently on and what's important to you, that really helps eliminate like this decision making fatigue. And in terms of like how like also understanding that everyone is different, right? And everyone performs different. Like I said, Hell Our said three things. Adam has his three things. You have a couple of things. Everyone has different things that clearly that they clearly know, hey, this really works for me. To in order to find that, you have to experiment, right? Uh for a long time, especially when I was at the peak of my career, every day, like a priming, priming visualization session before every session of like 20, 30 minutes. Nowadays, I do that a bit less, but back then it was really like, it was a no brainer. I remember I would sit down and a friend of mine said, oh, there's a good seat, big wheel, blah, blah. I said, what do you mean? I didn't prime yet. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like definitely first man. 20 minute primer, else I don't play, man. It's like, this is my criteria. Um, so yeah, yeah, I like it. Uh, sorry, I just, yeah, yeah sure. I, Go I realized like, Three, four things. Uh, it's just such a good topic. I, I had a, I have a friend who is like very funny guy. He, he, is, he's, he's the best example for this. What you mentioned. Mm -hmm. He had this. Uh, okay, guys, and I'm focusing on my session. Ten hour deep thinking, most focused session you ever seen. And and if you check his Skype is uh, you can have a caption under your name and it was exactly saying like i'm having 10 hour until the morning deep session focus and then he gets a phone call and, hey yami how are you you wanna go to the river and throw rocks into the water and he's like oh you know i cannot i cannot say no to that and he just left his 10 hour session so he was the most easiest person to the, the, the easiest person to, you know, derail from, from his purpose. And uh, for example, the, the meditation is weird for me because I totally understand what's the purpose and uh, I, I can see it would help me. Uh, and I had this challenge and I had meditation every day. And I felt like every day, if I had to do the meditation, I'm like, oh, okay, just let's do it and let's get over with it. So it was the complete opposite of meditation. But but when I'm playing and I'm not very focused, I realize that, yeah, meditation is, this is what you can learn. Like you have to eliminate all the stuff around you and try to focus on one little thing like breathing. And you, if you exercise this a lot, then obviously you can grind and focus on little things and not get distracted like what's the this music in piano version or or you know uh, so it's definitely i i totally understand what should do and uh, that's why i try to like force myself to do it but uh, it's it's uh, it's difficult because i feel like okay i have to do one more thing before grind i i kind of in a rush but i understand what should do and i had a very good experience in uh, I started playing tennis like five years ago, four years ago, and I, I, I didn't expect that I can learn some stuff from tennis in, to, to put in poker. And uh, I have a really good coach and I had this first amateur tournament in tennis and I, I was losing uh, very hard and I went to the coach and he's like, oh, what happened on your first match? And I was like, yeah, I lost like 6-0, 6-1, something like that. And he's like, yeah, but how did you lose? What happened? And I'm like, um, I, I don't even know. It just happened so quickly. I, I just lost. And he's like, no, you, you cannot lose like that. You, you have to be aware. Why did you lose? Like what went wrong? How did you lose the points? Like, did you have a lot of unforced errors or did the other guy hit a lot of winners? You have to be aware and realize what you did wrong. And I just realized I had this in poker so many times. I just can't wait to play poker. I'm just overstimulated. I jump into the table, 30 minutes gone. I lost seven binds and no idea what happened. And he's like the, the same, same idea. You have to be, you, you have to know how did you lose freaking seven binds in 30 minutes. If you don't know, you're not, not paying attention and you're not focused. So 
I, I can really relate to that and and uh, yeah, yeah that's it right like I would say meditation helps you notice I would say that's the biggest thing because you you mentioned like obviously also like you will be more concentrated and your mind wanders less but it's the difference that when your mind wanders you will notice it more frequently so you can return your focus back yeah. on the task at hand it's not just re- I think yeah. I think you do you probably do increase your focus span, but it's more that I notice when I'm distracted. Or like I said, I notice I feel a certain way before I start playing. So, because I've had the same experience that you, that I just sit down, an hour and by, stacks flow over the table. It's like, wait, what the fuck just happened? It's like, I just <laughs> lost, like, the moment when I sat down to play and start to play, that was like, I, I was not present for this last hour. And suddenly, like, what the fuck just happened? Just like your tennis match. And I noticed, like, with, with meditation specifically, these these things uh, happen less. I was gonna add like this thing that happened to your friend would have not happened with me because he said he was going into a ten hour session. When I'm in a session, like you cannot call me because there's no phone on, there's no Skype on, there's no Discord on. Like what the hell? Yeah. Like we, I remember I had a at an office back in the time and we took it so serious that I had my dad come over and we installed. So we had four desks in the office and we installed doors. So you had like we first of all I I built it like a bunker. So we added like, uh, uh, we added basically wood on both sides and on the end, and there were doors on the side. So the the rule was I would open my door so that's no, no one comes in and disturb me. Okay. <laughs> if my door is, 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 is open, you can, you can come in, but when I'm playing, I close the door, you know? So yeah, I, w- I would take concentration very seriously and like, uh, yeah, definitely no, no distractions allowed. And when you notice yourself getting distracted, return back to focus and then for example i would have maybe like some questions to help with that how how can i make how can i increase my win rate at this table that was like i had a couple of these questions whereas if i noticed that my mind was wandering i would return my attention back to one of these questions how can i get the maximum out of this table because often you know you get bored you feel like i'm already winning so how can I get the maximum out of my table? And then it's like, oh, well, actually, let, let me think about that for a second, you know? So you re- you you give your brain something to think about. And then it's like, oh, yeah, I'm just a bit autopiloting. But actually versus this guy, hmm, actually, I've been playing preflop wrong versus this guy. I should expand or I should tighten up and then I should do this. You start to think, kind of look ahead a bit in the poker tree. Okay, what's going to happen at this table? What's kind of the dynamic at the table? And how can I get more money? Because it's very easy to sit down. Especially, I think you you, you mentioned a certain period, right? You script into a nice game. You know, it's like fish <laughs> everywhere. I'm winning. Why would I pay more attention? That would yeah. zoom out. Like in battles, I, I noticed I had that less because I had like the competitive spark. But especially when when a recreational would sit down, let's say I'm battling for a half hour, 45 minutes. I'm very focused. Recreational sits down and I do like this. Ah, recreational <laughs> sits down. And I mean, I, I noticed like my posture changed. I'm a bit laid back in my chair. <laughs> and my win rates for a very long time in like six handed games were way worse than three four handed games, yeah. and they had nothing. That, that, that's very weird, uh, but that was everything to do with how I approached those games. I would just zone. I would not think anymore. I would be like, "Listen, the fish is here. I'm making money." But I was not thinking about how can I still make. It. If I would apply, I started to apply the same philosophy I had to battles to those six handed games and two recreationals, and that's when you know that that's when uh, bigger win rates uh, start started to. Uh, started to occur um i wanted to ask something i know you've been in uh, poker for 15 years i wanted to talk about the skill of longevity definitely something that you mastered you also mentioned like when we asked you like what are you most proud of in your career you said that every year for the 15 years that you played every year this current year is better than last year so you managed to consistently improve what are like some of the keys to being successful over as long a period of time in poker as you have. Yeah, uh, well, mostly, mostly that's true. Definitely, I had, I think, I had one or two years I didn't win or something like that. Maybe my EV was great, but on the whole spectrum, it was, it was really funny because I, I always. Uh, it, it it felt like I'm run riding the horse backwards. Like the games got tougher and I got I got better and I get got better results. And I like, what the fuck I'm doing? Why I'm not winning three much three X much money before? Um 
but actually uh, I had this idea but about every every year you could I, myself included you could hear people complaining I wish I could go back five years and play the same poker as I play now I, I would make millions because the games were so good and even like if now it's 2024 but you could go back three years with the accumulated skills you have now you would be like in paradise and I thought about the the opposite way like okay you obviously cannot go back in time but actually you can go into the future like if you mm. I mean study harder it's it's hard to if you don't know what to study but if you try to study harder and uh, get ahead of the field um, then basically what you're doing is going forward in time like you have your skill you would have three years from now you have ahead of the field and it could mean that you go down in stakes as well but basically you time travel by going into the future and, and playing your better game and i think i had this not like every year but basically i i always realized that okay, now I'm definitely ahead of my stakes and what games I play. So now I have a nice win rate. And then I slowly, I got caught on and people were playing similarly or, or even better. And then I realized, okay, now I have to study much more. And I like to, as I mentioned before, I like to do stuff in blocks and uh, I really like challenges when I, so, so I, I think uh, the, the quality of the games is really time dependent, like, um, like summer or winter, like winter is like the one, the best to go with. And, and I always had this, okay, like uh, September, August, September, something like that, I can, uh, study so much like even only study maybe I didn't do that but I, I could <laughs> I could even plan this and then and then December January February when every people staying at home Christmas bad weather getting dark early gonna games gonna be much better so I like to prioritize like this and and then I had like my own boot camps or even with friends, boot camps where, okay, guys, now we only study, we just have to figure out how to play better and then basically travel into the future. And then I have these good months where uh, you can grind a ton and you have your new skills and new strategies and new ideas you can try. And I think it worked very well, uh, basically for the, for my, for my time I was playing poker and, yeah, and I think the same same in MTTs and yeah I think uh, I think that's that sounds like a really really good approach I have never really thought about it that way I remember I think we did a podcast with Pats where he also had like I think every January or something he starts a year with like a boot camp like that for himself where he just redoes every re, re basically redesigns strategy for for every spot Hi guys, Rene aka The Wacko here with a quick Mechanics of Poker 2.0 announcement. In our program you will get access to 80 plus hours of content in which we will explain you all aspects needed in order to become a more successful poker player. Now one of these of course is the technical aspect of the game in which I'll be explaining you all the mechanics behind poker strategies. We'll be talking about GTO, exploitive play with an extra focus on the why behind certain strategies and why the population has certain leaks. And to increase your win rate even further, we've recently added a river bluff and bluff catching section so you can increase your EV when those pots become very big. Our mindset and performance coach Adam Carmichael, he took care of the mental game and performance section of this program in which he will teach you everything you need to know in order to break through limiting beliefs, better handle your emotions, break free from tilt and play your A game more consistently. 
And last but not least, we've added the management and optimization section in the program in which we will give you various tips and tricks to make it more likely for your poker career to succeed and how to continuously improve as a poker player. Now, on top of that, this concept is continuously evolving based on feedback and suggestions we get from our community. Next to all this content, you will have access to our exclusive Discord community, monthly live Q&A calls, and one-on-one -on -one coaching session in which we are going to be reviewing if you have been implementing the stuff that we teach you in the mechanics of poker correctly. So do you think you have what it takes to master the mechanics of poker? Go over to mechanicsofpoker.com and maybe you will get a chance to work with me and Adam and make more progress in your poker career. But for now, without further ado, let's get back into more goodness in today's episode. Now, you mentioned, and everyone knows, right? Yeah, you should study to get better. And you've mentioned study so many times. I already wrote this question down. I'm sure people will, will want to know. When you say study, what, what do you do? How, how can people study in order to, to go into the future, right? What should people study? How should people study? And how has your study process evolved, right, over, over the 15 years you've been playing poker? Yeah, so I, I listened to the couple podcasts and I either saw people saying that you cannot mimic solvers if you study solvers is bullshit. And yeah, definitely some truth about that. And there are other players like uh, you have to be like super exploitive, nothing else. Uh, I'm mean, basically the same, but others like GTO wizarding on four tables four hours a day or something like that. And I think it's it's not that simple either way. The, like, uh, I definitely had my fair share of staring 10 hours by a solver and felt like didn't learn anything, like not even a single thing. Like I tried to, you know, I created super start a super complicated strategies like i even wrote down okay this combo you bet 60 percent or 70 percent why would i ever do that but i think um you definitely can study stuff which is not useful but usually it's much more complicated and even if you want to exploit the shit out of people you you have to be watch and look and study a bunch of solves and just realize how people uh, think and how people play. And I think I was really good at modeling these situations. So I would definitely use solvers a lot, but I will use uh, pop tendencies as well and try to like, you know, create some nice node locks. Uh, I didn't really like GTO Wizard because of the so many choices you have. Like this, you know, you you do a practice and by the river you have like a one percent range, but it got much much better, especially with this AI. And I I started to use a lot more. Um, I still prefer my own solves because it's you know it's more tailored. But mm -hmm. if you want a quick quicker answer and uh, uh, so, so yeah basically I, I started to use both and uh, yeah, it's like convenience it, over it, accuracy right they order exactly. they give you a quicker con more convenient experience whereas your own <clears throat> since we're gonna have the same then in Pio there's a more accuracy because I think it's still a bit more but like I said this could also be us uh, like falling for the trap again right to to start using or start optimally using a certain software uh, a bit too late because it when exactly. you already have everything set up in Pi, you know, and it's easy for you to use. Convenient. It's easy to stick to stick to what's comfortable for you. Now I do think you know, uh, yeah. But like I said, GTO Wizard, like just the convenience and the speed with which it does it, yeah, does make it very yeah, so uh, very, so very beautiful. And and I I love these games where you can mimic your play and actually clicking on something like these drills and practices. I use GTO trainer as well and, and the wizard uh, trainer as well because it's so nice. Even if you learn something and, and you think you know it, 
and it's so let me give you an example i i create a, a node lock where i think people deviate from some stuff and you get like a very very easy solution because once you try to exploit sometimes the solution is just max exploit doing something like a hundred percent so like one example if people oversee that in four bad pots you just basically check raise everything on the flop maybe lock turn gem river yeah and uh, even if it is very very simple strategy but the fact that you create a soul or a uh, node lock and you train that like you just basically have to click raise every single time but you still get used to the environment you see the cards you have you see the flop you have you see the situation for example I, i'm super uh, deep in this when i try to i when i practice with pyo trainer i never set a heads up spot when it's a small blind big blind small blind buttons but yeah i do the same yeah it's it's uh i don't like uh feeling i'm playing a heads up i want to feel, feel the same environment i play six max i want to practice that so even if i have a very simple decision i like to practice in and see uh, it's gonna be more uh, realistic and when you when you're in the real game you're gonna recognize much more easily um, so i love those and yeah, I think I think I, I just um, also um, when I feel I have so much stuff to study, like we have endless stuff to study, even now, like it's basically yeah. how, 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 how do you prioritize? Yeah, um, so I try to prioritize by uh, like what is more common, like probably EP, MP, four bed spot, Doos, doos, doos swap is not that not that common. But I also like to use this fortune of wheel or something. When you so mm. so my my idea is if you have too many stuff to study and you cannot decide, then you're gonna be crippled as you mentioned before, and you think, oh, I don't know what to do. So I just you just feel like uh, uh, you cannot even choose and you don't do anything. So then I like to use. I know what spots I need uh, practice, and I just put in this wheel of fortune and give put it a, a label spin. on it and give it a spin, and then just study that. Uh, yeah, and um, I mean, it's uh, I, I also have a very good uh, comparison between tennis and poker that I have learned. I'm not sure. Have you guys played tennis or watch tennis sometimes? Do you guys know yeah. the rules? Yeah. So uh when i go for coaching we always do like different drills and different stuff and i feel like it's a it's not a one game tennis it's not like a one game it's a multiple different games like if you are at the net and doing a volley it's so much different than doing uh big shots from from the baseline and i think it's the same in poker you have so many little different games like a, a button cut of three bet spot is so much different than a small blind, big blind, open race spot. So basically you just have to learn all these different games. And basically it's a collection of games and you, you want to be good at the most common little games you're going to play. And always it's going to be different. A four bet spot, it's so much different. You have to... You have to practice all of them and learn the basics. And even if you, even if you just look bio sims and you think you don't learn anything, I mean, you have to have to see how it works and how it, how's the mechanics mechanics of poker. shout out to the mechanics. Yes. <laughs> No, but, then, so, but that's yeah. it, right? You have to go in with that mentality of and that curiosity of how does this work instead of tell me what to do. That's kind of the the it's like really much the mentality with which you open the solver. I think you also mentioned, right, that uh, you also misused it when you were trying to implement, okay, I should bet this 60, 70% of the time. And probably you kind of 
very quickly realize, okay, this is probably not the best way that I should use the solver. You mentioned the more effective way of using the solver is to compare like, okay, this is the equilibrium strategy. We understand why that's its way. We look at population tendencies, put in the numbers, run a node lock. I usually recommend also to maybe node lock slowly because in, mer in many spots indeed, because the equilibrium is so fragile, right? If we give it a couple percent more, it just says, well, yeah. just do this 100% of the time. <laughs> so I usually like to yeah, not yeah. exaggerate, but like node lock slowly so we can see, okay, what kind of other first hand that's, that strategies start switching with. Also at later street play, we have to kind of reevaluate. When it comes down to using data to get a better idea of what the pool is doing, right? And what the ranges are. What are like effective ways to use data in your opinion to build strategies? And what are like some traps that people should look out for? For example, we talked earlier in this conversation you had with Adam also about biases. And I feel like especially in data, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Can you maybe share your, your experience? Yeah, so just one more thing about the the studying and the node looking. Uh, it's funny, I just came across uh, not so long ago that basically if you start node looking some salt, you can justify anything. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I saw a video from a guy uh, doing some, I, I don't know, like middle position calling the three bet with eight, six suited. And he's saying, okay, this is a pure fold, but if you put that and that into the, yeah, you can see now it's a pure call. And yeah, so basically he, they're they're justifying their decision, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he ended up like, I think, stabbing the flop, stabbing the turn, and step calling the river. And basically he just said, okay, I don't think they protect their range, so they're going to just be uh, annoyed with ace king and like ace highs and start putting like turning into bluffs and basically he just set everything into the node lock the way he wanted and obviously turned out like the super plus cv line and i was definitely doing this as well i just realized with an extreme example that yeah you can you can justify and also in gto wizard if you if you do drills like it's really hard to make a big mistake like you're gonna usually have these uh, uh, frequency plays and and it seems like you didn't do big mistakes but maybe you, you did tremendous big mistakes uh, but you just can't see it. So about the data, uh, it's definitely uh, true that you can. I, I mean there are some. Uh, spots where you just have to know, have to learn what is a trustable data. And I don't even know how to. So sometimes I just see it in a video and I realize it's true. So let's give you an example. I was looking at a pop tendency calling in the big line. And if you, if you see, if you check up a, a huge database, you see like everything people call is super plus CV. And I'm saying, yeah, the conclusion is just, you call everything because people are not that aggressive probably in position and you just get away with it. But then you realize that if people call six, four offsuit, you're gonna see a showdown usually when they win. Like you're not gonna see the six, four suit, six, four offsuit when they fold it on the turn. So it's gonna be like the showdown bias, which I wasn't aware of for a couple of years. And then I realized, yeah, basically the, there are showdowns which can be trusted. Some showdowns cannot be trusted because of the nature of the way how it goes to showdown. And also the uncertainty, like if you have 10 examples, maybe as, as Adam said, Maybe it's not uh, not good enough or not precise enough, but also you can you can I, I can't remember this uh, mathematical expression, but you can check the certainty of the number like a binomial um, mm -hmm. something, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and basically you can you can have like a nice uh, educated guess on is this is this just a 
a noise in the data or is this trustful and yeah, uh, yeah. I, ju I just try to focus on the on the useful data. I remember I remember like before solvers when basically all we had was data or at least the game was way more exploitable right because we were mainly playing on data of other players and you were kind of making strategies on the fly I remember like sample size issues it was like this guy had a leak and then a month later he didn't have the leak anymore but now i realized <laughs> that probably it was it, it probably it was just statistical uncertainty that made the leak go away it's like oh i thought he had that leak oh he doesn't have that leak anymore so yeah there's definitely some truth in that i do feel like there is a lot of because poker we already have little information and i do feel like if we get some data that's pointing something in wrong direction i think if we have to wait until a confidence interval of like 95 percent certainty we missed up on a lot of good plus v opportunities if we wouldn't have been that much of a nit in wanting to have 100 percent certainty of a stat and obviously also there's ways you can use multiple stats that all point in the same direction um but yeah definitely true uh, like I said, I've definitely fallen victim of this uh, myself of ignoring kind of uh, sample sizes. I do also feel like in data, for example, if people only, let's say, for example, you see a folded spot, but it's a spot where population itself under bluffs. That means that the majority of the times that they faced that bet, it was value heavy, which blocks calling ranges. Therefore, full percentages will go up or people only follow through in like, equity improving scenarios so there's there's a lot of like it doesn't tell the same story like i experimented in my career as well and friends of mine as well where you just saw one data point and you're like hey data point says so let's go but you forget that when people arrive in that note they're telling a story that makes sense and i'm just now arriving at this note with a story that makes no sense at all and people are like what the fuck is this and they call you down it's like well what well, but the data showed that they're overfolding here with eight percent what the fuck is going on well that's because i'm telling a bullshit story with a bullshit hand so it it is gonna it is gonna screw the data a little bit ever experienced anything like this oh yeah man all the time i remember one of the podcasts i just saw you talking about when people say I'm exploiting the flop over C betting because they overfold and then they turn they gonna or or river they think about like what's gonna bluff and what I'm gonna bluff and why I'm gonna over C bet the turn as well. And uh, yeah, if, if you did exploitive stuff on the on the flop, like how do you think? Uh, and even in my earlier poker careers, poker career, I loved when I had the reasoning that I discounted some hands from his range on the turn and then add back on the river, like I'm going to get called by that because I get better hand or something. And it's just completely ridiculous. Yeah, I, I definitely uh, had problems with that. And, and I'm, I think I, you just have to learn with the data that some some things are not, not gonna be that useful and you not you cannot be that sure. And I also saw like very weird examples when people overfall turn and you do the node lock and then you realize they still gonna be overfolding even even by the river. And it's just so insane that you 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 would think if you did your exploitive stuff on the flop, then it's over because it's just so much stronger range. But then you realize, oh my God, they still should have called like this weak hands on a certain runout. So it could be really, um, it could be really in, unexpected when when you work with data and. Uh, you just you just have to be really careful and mindful uh, what you you're going to try. Like I remember, I started playing heads up again um, one or yeah one year ago, and I just I just met a guy who was like so freaking aggressive. I just decided that you you can call down this guy with anything and it would be okay. And then I just call down second pair worst ticker, like even blocking his bluffs, like 250 big blind deep and 
of course, he was just value betting super thin, <laughs> and I got destroyed. And you you have to be really careful about even how how sick you're gonna exploit because if somebody sees you doing that big of an edge adjustment, they they're gonna just stop do it and and you they're gonna crush you. So it's many many times it's not just simple that you just change in one or zero or a or b i remember uh, the stefan challenge against tutti 88 and i think tutti had this same attitude that i had many times that okay stefan equals bluffing all the time what should i do call call all the But time it's 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 way more difficult than that and you just you just cannot call down second pairs on a on a flash present stuff like that so you have to be really really careful and uh, i i was watching the your podcast with matt marinelli and he, if you check his graph and and stuff like that he he looks like the most exploited people person you can imagine and it was interesting from him hearing that he tries to exploit like very slowly like bit by bit and uh, yeah i think it it makes sense it there are some rare, rare occasions when you can go full exploit but usually you have to be careful because you you never know uh and and uh, yeah the, the data is the same i think you have to be really careful especially when it's something on the river on a single race spot like three three after three barrel your showdown gonna be i mean much uh, less um compliable yeah reliable yeah You also mentioned that next to studying, you have throughout your poker career worked with various coaches. I heard you mention Paul Otto, aka Internet, Tyler Forte, aka Google's Nose, if I'm not mistaken, right? That was his nickname. Yeah. Legend, yeah. legend on Poker Star back in the days. Uh, what were like the, do you remember any like big aha moments that either Internet or Mr. Google Nose taught you that you were like, oh, wow, this really changed the way I, I look at poker? Yeah. Uh... Maybe not like super big aha moments, but the way how different can a person think with the same game. Like I remember with Paul, I had this. Uh, so basically, I, I told him, "Okay, let's do a coaching. I want to be the best poker player ever. And what should I do?" <laughs> super easy question. And he started with a like a notepad and saying like. Who's gonna make the most money in poker? Like, okay, first is the poker side, and then second is the uh, the sponsored poker player. And uh, you know, like doing a sheet for me, I would never even think about. I would just consider the the how I play or what should I do on the river. So he he started from like a very different perspective, and. Uh, For a similar idea, I heard a friend of mine got coachings from Oxota, I think. He's a, a mm. famous entity player, the Canadian guy. Mm -hmm. uh, not 100% it was him, but I think it was him. It's the, And Vores, the first right? session, Yeah. The first session he had, he said, you shouldn't get let yourself buttoning that much. And, and turned out he lost like 3,000 euros by grimming because other players just play the button and leave. And I mean, who, what kind of coach looks so deep into your database? I would, I would, would never even find it even in my own database. Like, so people can think so differently about the stuff. And I think it was the same with Tyler. Um, he, he was thinking about stuff I would never realize myself i mean i i i'm not like i cannot even give like a, a perfect example i try to think one but it was basically just the just the way he was approaching uh, the game and poker and 
Also, I think he played a lot of Ignition or Bodova or something. Mm -hmm. And there was a very different uh, hand history. I'm sure you know they you cannot you say it's anonym tables but yeah you can see whole for cards, one right? day you can see whole cards so he had like a completely different um experience with the showdowns like i i never saw full showdowns in my life where i was playing so he had a lot of insights and i think maybe poker detox started with the same um, concept so obviously it's a very useful thing and I couldn't play Bodova or Ignition ever from Hungary. So it was a new thing for me. And it's very funny when you say see actually people uh, folding some good hands and you would never see, you could, you could guess that you never see these top pairs in three bad pots at showdown. So they fold it, but you never, can be certain so it was nice to see uh full hall cards but yeah usually usually it was because they were thinking about stuff or or studying stuff i wouldn't even study or and yeah. they also it's also so, it seems like that they look they zoomed out further for example you might come to a problem or a student might post a hand where it's like i'm in this river decision and my response might, might be like, why were you in this game in the first place? It's something yeah. like that, you know, or like people like to focus on like, oh, should I call this river check race? Now I'm like, like, we should have maybe checked the flop and this whole scenario that we're now discussing for the next half hour is just all an ass played scenario, which we should just never get in again. A lot of, a lot of discussions in poker are around, as I like to call them, ass played scenarios where they just steered the hand into a part of the tree where it's like, yeah, this is a very shitty spot. You want, you want to know the solution? And then they think, for example, that me or maybe you, we have the answer. I'm like, my answer is I will prevent getting into this spot by not having played the hand the way you did yeah. it. It's and not you like would I never, now have a better you never right, think about right it. Now I'm, I'm, right now I'm as fucked as you, right? But I will <laughs> try to be in this situation the least as possible. All right? But this spot is indeed yeah. a nasty spot. Could this spot have been prevented? By either, and like I said, this can be early in the tree or by not sitting down at this table versus this guy in the first place. You know, if we go even even for a more zoomed out perspective. Like, you, you labeled yourself a bit as a, as a scientist, right? Um, what are like some of the most controversial strategies you've experimented with over the last 15 years? Do, do, do any stand out where like, okay, oh, I yeah. tried this for yeah. a little while? I, I guess lately you he hear less and less about these crazy strategies and ideas. But I remember, uh, probably it's better if I don't say any names, but there was this Hungarian guy who was opening like 90 plus percent on the button and doing, doing crazy stuff. And usually it came down to people thinking they are very good and others are stupid. like. I definitely had this problem too, like thinking about thinking about professional poker players, like, oh, this guy is just stupid. I mean, he's been playing poker for eight years. He's clearly not stupid. Uh, so my friend took some, I think, bought from him 10 hour coaching in a pack. And this guy just he was just saying, oh, you can open 90% on the button, 45% on the cutoff and, and see that everything. And, and uh, he was saying like ridiculous claims. And my friend uh, did like two sessions and, and it was terrible. And he said, okay, I just don't want to continue this. And uh, he said, okay, just stop this, maybe send back the money. And I think the the guy was not even sending back the money and uh, my friend just said, okay, I don't even care. <laughs> I, I don't even care if you don't send back the money, but I don't need the coaching because it was so bad. And the same guy uh, had, a, I think, a coaching group. And by the way, uh, in his defense, I think for him, it was actually working. Uh, but in the same 
way he couldn't really explain, explain why did it work for him and not for others. And I think he had also a coaching group when uh, tried to teach people play like that, but they couldn't. And uh, there were very funny conversations about his students. They were saying like, yeah, these guys are just, these regs are so stupid. You can do whatever you want. And, but eventually they never succeeded with this. Um, I mean, you can also so, yeah, understand that if you send out a bunch of horses opening 90% of the button, like maybe, maybe you can get away with it, but to implement yeah. that as like a mass strategy for a stable, we have to consider, uh, we have to consider some consequences. Yeah, but uh, there are very controversial strategies with you, you maybe not even realize. So even I had this mistake that I was playing many poker rooms, many poker tables, and already had like 5,000 hands on a guy. And then I just realized he three bets 32% big blind versus small blind. And I never noticed it. I'm like, what the hell? How did I not notice it? So sometimes there people have like super crazy strategies and you don't even realize it. And they could go undercover for a very long time, especially uh, if something needs a uh, very high risk. So for an easy example, if somebody four bet, four bet bluffs you all the time, like when you jam your good hands, they're gonna just fold. And if they have good hands, they're gonna call. And it's even if you know they bluffing a lot, you have to jam like we can whole stack, yeah, yeah. And and uh, it you can run bad with that. He can easily have like a couple good hands. And also it can happen the opposite way, like live you feel this guy four bets me four times in a row and you just jam on him and turns out he, he would never even four bet bluff. He just had a uh, good run. So I think uh, there are still very surprisingly uh, super exploitive strategies uh, so sometimes I see a player have 30 plus percent check raise on the flop, but you don't see that very often. So sometimes you, it just goes unnoticed. Yeah, that's true. And like you said, for, for certain stats as well, you know, you need quite a sample for it, uh, uh, to start to actually pay attention to it. Um, you, I think. Since you know you've you've been you've been playing for a long time and you grew up before the solver age, so to say, what do you <laughs> think are like some skills from players like yourself, me, Adam? Like we all grew up in the, in that area. What are kind kind of some skills that we learned back in the day that still gives us an edge today that maybe the new school players who straight away grew up with solvers kind of miss? This is a really hard question because that was exactly my thought when I heard somebody just started playing poker a couple of years ago and playing high stakes. And I just didn't add up for me. Like if I think about my whole journey, I did so many, I watched so many videos on YouTube. I just so many hands, so many experience, like, how can this guy accumulate that much experience in such a short period of time? But then my friend pointed out that they, they didn't have to go over the, the guessing phase where you don't know what you have to do and you just seven bet bluff with king queen because you have no idea and you, you just think the other's bluffing and you, you pull those uh, random lines and yeah I it's really hard because you're asking the opposite and I would say that just experience and and we had so much different games and different uh, situations but that would like Phil Helmut say to the online grinders that he had such a big experience and everything and and yet I don't think he's even close to a 
good online player because they just accumulated experience so much faster and so much more precise. It's really, really hard to, to combat that. Yeah, but, we, they 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 didn't develop maybe certain bad habits. Exactly, we had to yeah. now overcome right and like old ways, the old old flawed ways of approaching poker that they didn't really fall for because they knew it straight away from the start. And also nowadays, it's more about playing a good strategy, whereas in the in the past it was more like a mind game, right? You're trying to get get into the mind <laughs> of the other guy. Exactly, the feelings are they're so present, like what you felt and you suspected and you try to you know fuck over the other guy with some strategic option and yeah your feelings dictated your decisions and turns so out maybe some spots so your so yeah. your conclusion is that uh, we 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 have gained no <laughs> We've gained no edge <laughs> no. by by have start, having started start no, back in the definitely, day. Definitely, definitely not that. Um, probably uh, bankroll management and money management and life. Like we talked about a lot of stuff, which is maybe not even helpful for poker. So let's say I do uh, meditation. I do good food, uh, fasting, diet. Uh, be careful uh, exercising I'm not 100% sure if you are against a guy who's playing 15 hours a day home and studying and not even just sitting not even working out not even doing not eating pizza all day I'm not even sure if you could outperform him because he just has so much passion to the game and so much time um so what what we do is is more like not just poker but health and and the whole thing together like a very good balance and uh, sometimes if you're very very good at one thing but the only thing you're good at it's gonna hurt you very bad later um, so i don't think that's the right way but if you think about just poker wise it's very hard to compete against who somebody who just allocates much more time to uh, this stuff. Jesus, somebody's honking. Budapest, so, man. Budapest <laughs> trap. Yeah, yeah. No, so so I, I agree. <laughs> and it's also probably you would outperform and on longevity, right? Because obviously what he's doing is less sustain sustainable. I do feel like, like, like you said, and it's probably part of it as well, right? You, your experience and realizing that we're humans, I think they see the game maybe sometimes a bit too static and too robotic, and they don't realize that they are a human that needs taken care of, right? And they're playing against humans who have certain flaws, certain, certain, there, there's just certain spots, probably even more so in live poker, where like, yeah, this, this guy just always has it or never has it. And they feel to think, they, they feel to think in that type of way. And they would just be like, "Oh, what do you mean? This is my strategy." And it's it's not it's not that that's not correct, right? It's just a different way of approaching the game that, in certain scenarios, uh, uh, will be superior. But yeah, I definitely obviously agree that the later you started, the big the bigger advantage you have. I was just curious if there was something that you think would still be able to give you an edge. You also mentioned that you've obviously invested a lot of coaching. You also did some coaching yourself. In your experience, what is like the most common leaks you see amongst like mid-stakes players, let's say, and how should they go about fixing them? I, I saw, I've seen many, many different mistakes. Um, uh, I, I I met so many different people. Like I met very very smart guys. I think way smarter than me and love to study. And uh, they just hate grinding and they don't like to grind. They don't grind. They they don't like the variance. And uh, it's really very weird that how many different things you need to have to be a successful poker player like uh, maybe you would be the best poker player but you just don't like doing it 
and and other guys just love to grind they grind 300 hours even a month if they have to but they hate to study they can't study they don't study um <clears throat> i had a funny coaching when a guy it was like 10 years ago maybe even more the guy started the coaching that uh, showing me a hand and i'm like okay let's see this hand i think pre-flop and then he cuts me off like okay don't talk about pre-flop i know everything about pre-flop just let's focus on post-flop situation and i'm like what <laughs> you you clearly don't know and uh, <clears throat> it's uh, yeah it wasn't a long uh well, it wasn't together. a long coach session yeah i can imagine <laughs> yeah uh i i think uh, the most common mistakes are either of these two like not studying at all or or just studying but not doesn't like to grind so it's it's so weird uh, and uh, maybe there are other mistakes when people are actually pretty good and study and play as well but they just play the worst tables possible and uh, they they think you just have to baffle all the time and you just be better than others but actually they not better than others and and they have to realize so it's, it's just so many points where you can go wrong with poker and and uh, you don't even realize that's what you're doing wrong and actually when you even if you're really good but playing bad tables it's gonna destroy your um, your mentality and your motivation. And also, we talked about if you're doing a Las Vegas summer, like if if you grind online MTTs, you you do a Sunday, you play 15 tournaments, maybe 20 tournaments, you bust all, no no ITM. Next day you fine, you forget about it, and that's it. But when you play live Las Vegas, you bust 20 tournaments that's like 25 days or 20 days in a row feeling miserable and losing every single day it hits you much differently than losing for one day but it's also like 20 tournaments it's nothing but you you um, feel it much more differently and i think that's a very common mistake that people miss some part of the of the very simple basics I gave, just study hard, play hard, play a lot, do both, and you, you have to do it uh, a lot. And if you're missing one of them, maybe 10, 15 years ago, if you don't study and you're a genius, you can just play. Maybe even now there are some guys you can just play, but uh, most of us just have to study, have to understand the game better and have you have to game select and it, these or are very very complex things that like you said even the game selecting is not just simple that there is a big player and i sit there is so much complexity like if you just see the rate structure there are situations when a very small losing uh, recreational on your right is not worth it but like five times higher limit even with much better players, you would get a 200 hour table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it comes back to like, again, like a little bit more bigger picture, long term yeah, thinking yeah, yeah. of your win rate. And I think to, to go back to what we talked about in terms of what maybe new school and what you said, well, the experience, this is, I think, a lot of things that you learn through experience, right? This is not something that the solver can teach you per se. Yeah, definitely. And with my example that these newcomers who just couple, started a couple years ago and playing high stakes, I didn't mean as a, a that's an easier route for them. I just explained some of the newcomers uh, playing high stakes. I, I still think it's very rare and our advantage having a huge many years experience is still very tough to 
overcome. So, so even if it felt like a disadvantage to us, I think it's still an advantage. And of course, there are uh, exceptions, but usually people have to have to have huge experiences, many hand histories, many plays, many hours studying. They they cannot just know everything. Yeah, managing uh, your career, managing your life, managing your emotions. Yeah, exactly. And so many things can go in the can come on on the way. And um, yeah, you you maybe have issues in your personal life, and then it's hard to uh, focus on poker. Um, yeah. So basically, I, I spoke about the the mistakes they make in a more more broad way, not like a no. But these like the, if these are indeed stuff, like but, the the biggest yeah. mistakes that you see, then obviously that's uh... yeah. And also, it's very very. It's much more complicated to be um, be a professional poker player now because there's so many uh, coaching groups, stables. It's usually when people ask me about, like maybe on Instagram, that, hey, I saw you are a professional poker player. How can I be a professional poker player? What should I do? I'm very hesitant to what should I answer? Like. Usually I, I tell the truth that, look, it's, it's much more different now. It's very, very difficult. I'm not saying, I'm, I'm never, I never say it's impossible, but I say it's, it's very, very tight uh, area now. If you want to be good, it's very, very hard work, very long work, maybe not going to win any money for one or two years. Maybe you need a, coaching group it's not like 15 years ago where you just hop on the train and you just play anywhere you want now i would say like some sort of coaching nowadays is uh is definitely yeah nece necessary I, I would say it's it has become indeed a necessity i would say the same if someone says oh poker and they have no experience so they're actual complete beginners i say no no don't don't do it don't do it. <laughs> like you know, if they're at least already grinders, you know, they're already playing 100 and 50 now, and they wanna, and they are thinking like you know, they're they're winning and they're combining it, or like the study is over and they're thinking about getting a job or should I give a shot at this poker thing? That would say, hey man, g give it a shot. But like if if you know nothing about poker, yeah, I would say no, don't. There's probably other things you can do uh, that are probably more more worth your time, Adam. Like, um, also talked a lot about like problems of people studying too much or maybe studying too little from your experience working with players, especially also from like a more mental game per perspective. What do you think are like some underlying causes that make them overstudy or make them underplay? Well, I think first of all, most people understudy. I think I remember Pad saying probably 95% of players understudy and the 5% who study enough, 90% of them study too much. So you've got 95% understudying and then 90% of the last 5% study too much. So you've got 1% roughly who've got the kind of optimal balance between studying enough to, to move forward. So uh, why do people have problems with studying? So we'll, we'll touch on it from the not studying enough. To be honest, like a lot of it is they enjoy grinding more than studying. And as we we're talking about in the conversation, you get the ROI from grinding, you can just jump straight in, you know exactly what you don't want to do, you get the stimulation straight away. With studying, sometimes you're like, what should I study today? What, what should I be doing? And a lot of players aren't organized. I, I've had so many conversations, like probably hundreds, maybe thousands, with players saying, I want to study more. I want to study more. And as soon as we start breaking it down, it's like they don't prioritize their studying, like we're talking about time blocking your day, in the same way they prioritize their grinding. So, uh, yeah, I think not studying is more of a problem than over studying. But then you said you get the other players who go too far studying. They want certainty. They like the, the challenge of learning things. But then the insecurity of playing, because when you study a lot, you get very good at knowledge. But then you need to execute that knowledge. And guess what? Mistakes, insecurity, not, not getting good feedback. Oh, that didn't feel nice. Oh, just lost a buy-in. Oh, it feels nice just going back to the to the lab and studying this stuff so that you get this kind of disconnect between wanting to learn and wanting to execute so uh, yeah it's, it's it's tough like it's tough to find that balance between studying enough and um yeah not, not studying too much so I, I think as you mentioned throughout the conversation trying to find that like in a 90 minute study i think most players could study an hour to 90 minutes a day finding a way to have a deep study block if you do that six seven days a week 
like you're gonna be so far ahead like in a few years time because not many players are consistent enough with their studying so uh yeah it's a tough one to unpack but i think the those are some of the reasons i would i would touch on uh, yeah i wanted to go back to uh, something you mentioned which i thought was really important you said when Randy kind of questioned you on the kind of skills of the old school players compared to new school players you said like the package of skills to be successful is so complicated there's, there's so many things that come into uh made a successful poker player. This reminds me like early in my career, it's probably three years in, me and my, two of my friends were having good success. So we're like, all right, we'll train up our other friends to be successful poker players, super easy. And then as we started to go through the process, we're like, okay, we'll teach them the strategy, execute this, how can it go wrong? And we quickly realized this isn't working. This isn't like their ability to execute and be so spoon for the strategy wasn't working. Their ability to take risk, their mindset, their emotions that were coming up, well, it was, there were so many factors that came into it, which kind of at the time was really eye-opening to me. Now it's much more simple, but there's so many things I was like, ah, being a poker player isn't just know the strategy, execute, there's a lot of skills that come into it. So the question I wanna ask you, you've had 15 years of kind of building your, your toolkit, so to speak. So what package of skills would you say uh, you've built skills, habits, we could call as well, to be a successful poker player? We can go for it slowly, and that's a tough question to uh, unpack, but like you mentioned studying, playing, bankroll management. So let's, let's try to unpack some of the, the package of skills that have allowed you to be successful in poker. Yeah, <clears throat> I think a good realization was uh, if you are playing poker for 15 years, you always get lost in the, so, I'm sure you remember when you started playing poker, like, oh my God, you're, you want to do this every hour, every day. You are so pumped. You just want to do it. It's so fresh, so new. It's such a good feeling. And over 15 years, you're going to lose this so many times. And you think after 10 years, like what could change? Like, it's just so boring. You're doing the same thing over and over again. Uh, so for many people, it just feels like work. I have to grind six hours. I just have to, maybe the same I felt sometimes with meditation, <laughs> but uh, they just they just think they have to get done with this and, and then they can do whatever they want. And I had this and uh, people say, it's, oh, it's like the, you, you love the game. So it's easy for you because you can't wait to play again when you're vac vacation and stuff stuff like that. It's kind of true, but I had the same feelings. Like I hated the game. I got bored of the game. It's everything the same. So I think what worked for me is using studying as a tool to, to just fell in love with the game again. So if you find a spot where you're very weak and you start to understand that spot, and practice and realize what you did wrong and what should you do. And you just, basically you can create new strategies very easily. If you, if you don't know a spot, I think for me, it was many years, the small blind, big blind spot. I always studied button, big blind. I always studied three bad spots and I never really studied small blind, big blind because yeah, you know, sometimes other people limp, other people just open raise all the time. I mean, it's just, let's, let's study something else. And it's like one of the most common situation and it's so completely different than other spots. So when I have, like, I, I try to create some kind of um, thesis, like I would, I would study for university and uh, let's say just go one by one, like very simple steps. I, I check one flop. I just try to, you know, get a framework, what to do with what types and what like the, the basic rules I can use. And then I have a complete sheet, like one or two pages of like basic stuff. And it's, I can check other flops and, I can see that, oh, this stuff works here too. It's very similar. And then I use this to just love the game again. And I can't wait to just experience it and, and play again. And sometimes it you even have to, maybe the good word is to, to shift your thinking. Like you have to, you, you try to feel like a brand new poker player again like you have to be thirsty for the knowledge and you have to be like 
uh, <clears throat> pumped for the for the situation. And uh, when when you start a new session, you can wrote down just a few things you you want to focus because it's going to be so complicated session so many things can happen but just you you write down okay i realized this and that in small bar and big blind spot i'm just going to focus on that and let's see and then you have something to grab on and something to focus on and it worked me really really well that sometimes i felt like oh i don't even want to play again because it's just so boring and then switch my thinking and uh, learn some new stuff. And I just, oh my God, I just want to play eight hours and it works and it's so good to see. I think you've just shared the KZO longevity right there. And it's, you mentioned studying to fall in love with the game and always keeping the mind curious, trying to learn new things. And as you mentioned, like, it's not always that every day you wake up, you love poker, you want to play it. Sometimes you've got to consciously direct yourself to do some kind of hard studying to re-engage the mind. But you mentioned year after year, and you've constantly found ways to continue to study, to uh, yeah, kind of re-engage that kind of love affair. As you mentioned as well, like early in your career, first probably one to three years, honeymoon period, it's an amazing game, so interesting, so fun. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah, I kind of know a lot about poker. It's quite a same, same game, so to speak. And now you've got to challenge yourself to constantly keep that beginner's mindset. What's new? What can I learn? So uh, it's amazing that you're 15 years in and you're still thinking that way. You're still trying to find those novel things to learn, to improve on. I think as humans, when we've, we've got something new that we're trying to uh, learn about or execute, it just engages the mind in a very different way. And we feel engaged in what we're doing. And I think as you get further in your career, you just got to make sure that stays going, it keeps, keeps alive. So yeah, it's a very, very good hack to longevity there to um, use studying to keep falling in love with the game. So yeah, as we, we go yeah. through this conversation, I've been trying to like kind of skill stack your kind of package of skills. So I'll just go for the ones I've wrote down and we'll see if any ones you can add. So one is studying hard, continue to have that hard study approach, playing a lot as well alongside your studying, good bankroll management, learning the bankroll management approaches that work with you. Alongside that, risk tolerance, knowing your risk tolerance and trying to uh, work on that if you're trying to move up stakes. Game selecting well. Well, consistency, when you're not feeling like working, you still gotta work, as you just mentioned now, you gotta to continue to put in the work year after year. Learning how to learn, this, is, this includes systems of learning, but also the desire to learn. As you mentioned, like when I look at like the young kids who rise quickly, what have they got an edge on? Just the desire to wanna to learn, the desire to put hours after hours after hours back to back with not thinking. That is, that's a good skill set. So th those that get edge in that department, they might go out of balance, but it's a, it's a real good skill to uh, have that desire to want to learn. Emotional regulation, a skill of being able to manage your feelings, as you mentioned, we mentioned dealing with the survivor bias that's got going on. I think focus and energy optimization, we've mentioned morning routines and things to prime yourself, but how do you uh, show up and focus in the right way? So uh, they're kind of the skills I think I've unpacked from what you've been saying and you, the skills you've been perfecting. Anything that I've missed or anything else you feel that's important for your success as a poker player? Yeah, uh, yeah, I have a good one. Uh, also, just one more thing about the the spelling love in the in the game and studying. So, if you if you don't study for a very long time, studying feels like the least last thing you want to do. And uh, if you, if you think about when you go to the gym and many people just hate doing legs, it's just pain in the ass. They do anything to skip the legs, but when you force yourself to do legs like five uh, for five weeks five times or something you actually start loving it because you get better at this and and you and, and i think it's very much the same with learning it's also not just helps you to learn the game again because you knew you know much more stuff but you also start to love and enjoy studying because you always First, you have you know your your walls when you don't feel you learn anything, but then you learn something and it feels so much better, and you start loving studying as well. And it goes back and forth. When I don't study for a long time, um, I I feel like I don't want to study, but then I start studying again and I realize I learn much from that. Then I start loving it again. Um, and I was about to say something else. Um, yeah, also motivation. I had many friends who were good poker players, smart, loved the game, of not loving the game, but like, okay. But they didn't have any motivation. So for example, 
they would not even buy themselves a new shoe, new pair of shoes. Like one, one of my friends would say, oh, why would I spend uh, 100 bucks on a shoe? And he, what he was doing, he, he was never ever, um, um, how do you say, uh, give a present to himself for achieving something. So for me, it I mean I was always uh, I always dreamed about a nice house. I always dreamt about cars. I always had these goals in my mind. I, I want to have this and that. And uh, when you when you get something, it obviously feels like an egoistic dream and uh, and a materialistic stuff. But it it also you have something you can basically even touch and it's the the result of your of your uh, grind and your many years so i always had this and and um, even like cars i i i love cars and and uh, when i was a kid i saw like uh, movies with like Ferraris and Lamborghinis and stuff. And I was like, oh my God, I, I just wanna feel that and see how it's gonna be. And uh, yeah, it's, it was super big motivation that I had uh, even materialistic goals in my head, not just financial freedom. And, and then the same with the traveling. My, some of my friends, they were just never traveling. They didn't even care. And uh, I think you can easily burn out when you, you don't have to be uh, giving yourself a present by, a, you know, a fancy vacation or, the, or a fancy car or anything, but you have to have something you, um, you give as a prize yours, to yourself, I think. Yeah, I think it's important to have an aspiration to strive towards. So as you mentioned, like motivation to move towards something. If you think about human nature, like why would we work hard? Why would we make ourselves do stuff? It's always to get somewhere or to get some at the end of it. Often the, the short-term pain is for like the long-term future. So if we don't have something long-term to aim for, whether it's a car, a house, a uh, financial freedom or just feeling sense of fulfillment, we're always going to go for the path of least resistance, which often means Netflix, YouTube, eating the, the wrong foods. And it's very easy to get sucked into that trap. So as you're alluding there, you had friends who didn't have the motivation to move towards something. So uh, they're always struggling. And it's interesting. I think a lot of people spend way too much time on discipline, like self-discipline. That's like kind of a popular topic. I don't really believe in self-discipline at all because if you look at disciplined people, they're not making themselves do stuff. So discipline is like a whip. Make myself do it. Make myself do that. Make myself do that. Whereas if you have aspirations, like a desire, a purpose, or something you're moving towards, you do the disciplined behaviors because they're taking you to your goal. It looks like discipline, but it's not. It's like the person who's motivated, it's like a Kobe Bryant's a great example, NBA basketball player, and he would get up at the, three o'clock in the morning and go to the gym. Why? Because he wanted to be the best basketball player in the world. Someone would go, wow, that's so disciplined. He was like, I can't not. The alarm's off and I've got to get up, got to go to the gym. There's a difference between uh, desire towards stuff. So I think for you, you've tapped into uh, motivating behaviors or things you want to achieve, things you want to experience, whether it's cars or other experiences, but it's, it's tapping into, uh, I'm moving towards this and I will do these actions to move in that direction. So it's tapping into that kind of, those drivers, which I think is really important. All right, question, final question from me. I want you to uh, go back to your younger self. We'll go 15 years in the past, that time when you just blew your role playing heads up and you're going for a run in the rain. Yourself today is gonna run alongside your younger self. What advice would you give to that younger self that you wish I'd have known when you were starting out? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think it would be definitely the time travel example, like don't focus on the past and be annoyed that you didn't start earlier, but focus on what can you learn. Um, and I would definitely urge myself to just study more and understand the game better because it's just gonna makes your, make your life much more easier. Like it, it's gonna be, even if you think you have to earn this and that much of money. And, uh, and if you don't do it, then you cannot continue your poker career. You're gonna end up saving so much time. 
And uh, other thing I would say is quite hard because you you always think like, oh, I have to grind so hard. I, I'm just gonna grind 12 hours. It's good games. I'm gonna stay in the game and wreck my sleep and wreck my health and I can sacrifice. And uh, when I started po playing poker, there were still debates on the sleeping stuff. Like you could hear quotes from Arnold Schwarzenegger that you, you sleep enough in your grave and you, you don't need sleep. You have to achieve your goals. You don't care about sleep. And this grind culture, even Gary V, who I really like, but he says like, oh, fuck the sleep, you, you go 200 hour grind. And I think you just, you just perform so much better if you get a good sleep and good health. Obviously, sometimes there, there is a little bit of trade-offs. Maybe you think you're, it's, it's your one and only chance, like the biggest, best game you ever had, but chances are it's not. So I would, I would say to myself to, to just be well rested, have a, a routine, like you don't have to sacrifice your days and weeks for, for a grind. It's really hard for MTT players, I know. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and also, uh, yeah, bankroll management, but I think it was kind of inevitable for me to, to go broke with the, cause I just didn't know anything about it. So even maybe even if I go back in time and tell myself, maybe I, I still have to experience it to understand it. So it's, these are really tough questions, but I think these would be the suggestions to myself. <laughs> Great answer. Yeah, I think it's sometimes hard to go back because you understand the lessons you went through were kind of needed to get to where you are. But also it's like, it's kind of like shortcuts. It's like a cheat code. If I go back and just like miss those two ones yeah. out and go through. So you mentioned like studying more. You mentioned optimizing your recovery. Uh, I, I felt the same trap as you actually in terms of sleep and recovery. I'm not sure if I've shared this story on the podcast, but when I first started poker, moved to Thailand with two friends. And because we live in a new country, we wanted to maximize our ability to play lots of poker, but also to have a good lifestyle. So I went, hmm, what can we cut out? Sleep. So we started reading up on sleep and polyphasic sleep at the time was a, a thing going around some online forums. So we went, okay, oh, this po yeah, polyphasic sleep four and a half hours sleep with two 20 minute naps. Yeah, it was called the I Every Man to. Two Sleep. <laughs> Okay. I think, I think months, Alki, Alki did that too. Yes, I did a 12 months. My first 12 months of poker oh were God. on the sleep schedule. So we, we basically would go to bed at 10 p.m. Uh, no, sorry, 5 p.m. in the afternoon. And we'd wake up at 9.30. We'd make breakfast together at 10 p.m. And we'd grind from 10 p.m. till 10 a.m. in the morning with two 20-minute naps throughout that 12-hour 12 12 hour span. And in all honesty, like you get to the point where you're so used to being sleep-deprived that when people ask me, are you tired? I'd be like, Mm, not really sure, I feel fine. But then once you come out of it, I did a full year of it, and I went back to normal sleep, and I was like, oh my God, I was literally uh, so sleep deprived the whole time that I couldn't even see it. That like your baseline of what's tired gets completely altered. And at this time, like I, I hadn't read up on sleep and I, there wasn't as much material, but I started to think like, this can't be a, like a sustainable way of living. I knew it was extreme because the, the, the kind of forums that we found this on were, were kind of the biohacker world of kind of extreme people. But then I was like, okay, as I got in, more into it, I realized, ah, feeling good, is actually the best thing and sleep. I went from like the, now I'm probably eight and a half a nine hour guy compared to like the five hour sleep. But I think it's understanding the variable of performance requires good recovery. And if you cut recovery, you're gonna cut performance. Maybe not directly, maybe not one for one in the same night, but if recovery is consistently suboptimal, you're going to feel the performance hit. So yeah, I just wanna share my story on sleep because I've, I'm a sleep advocate now, but I was a, a wreck with sleep for a long time. And I think understanding what you need to, uh, to do recover. So if I could go back in time, that would definitely be a little knock on the shoulder of myself. Go, Adam, get to bed. This is a, a bad approach. All right, That's... Rene, for yourself, any more questions you've got? Mm, maybe one more. I'm always curious, like what, obviously everyone wants to be successful. What is your definition of success? Sure. Well, uh... I, I, I have changed my mind many times with this and I, I had this thought experiment um, 
if you go back to a class of yours, you had like a elementary school meetup, you know, like every 10 years or middle school meetup. And uh, what, what would you like, even like, how would you go? Like, if you have a nice car, would you go with the nice car or would you talk about your, uh, what you do and what you achieve? And would you be proud of what you have uh, accomplished? And first, my thought was like, no, I would hide it uh, because I don't want people to be uncomfortable when maybe they didn't have that successful life, or you would say. And then I changed my mind that, oh my God, you have to be have to be proud. You have to go there like hard, and you be have to be open and. You don't care about if you if you maybe hurt people's feeling, but you have to be honest and uh, proud. And then I realized the third phase when I just I just realized that success is such a broad definition def, de, definition because you uh, uh, instead of proud, I got more. Uh, self-aware of how uh, lucky I am to be able to in my shoes and to do this and uh, um, how privileged to have this life and even to be able to learn poker so even my parents we we weren't rich and we were like very very basic family but I, I get everything I I wanted, I, I had a really, really good life. And, and uh, I had this uh, freedom to, to just get into poker and learn poker and, and study and, and uh, achieve some success in it. And if you think about it, some, maybe some other dude is just working in a restaurant 15 years, uh, 15 years for 12 hours a day. That means he's as much as grinding as me and maybe maybe even more uh, disciplined and uh, maybe even working way harder than I am. But maybe he didn't have the opportunity to, to do what he loves to do. And uh, as, as I al always tell to my friends that you can, uh, if the, what's the most, the, the least thing you can control is where you have been born. Like you, you could be born in China, you could be born in Africa, you could be born in the United States. Uh, and how would you rate your, if, if there is 8 billion people and you have the chances where you, where you can born, get born, how would you rate where you were born on a zero to 100 scale? And I think like even Hungary, with a small village like next to a city uh, where I was born, it's like definitely top 90%. Like, Rene, you from the Netherlands? I Netherlands, think. yeah, that, that that's, definitely running good there. <laughs> that's definitely running good. And I think you, you're you from Adam from the UK? Yep, correct. Yeah, so I mean, it, those are like, how, how, how can you get better? Like, maybe you can born into a rich family in the United States or Canada, or I'm not even sure, but you can certainly born in Africa, having eight, uh, but it's very, like you don't have any, any control on that. So I was more about appreciating uh, the, the situation I'm in and, and I'm, I'm really uh, glad and happy that I, I can be in my shoes and I, I, can, I, can be, uh, I can do what I love to do. And uh, yeah, it just, you just have to find your own uh, thing you're passionate about if you can do it, if you're fortunate enough. And then you just try to give your max, I think. All right. Well, I want to I wanna thank you, uh, Laszlo, for sharing... Uh all your wisdom on the on, on this podcast and your experience that you've gathered over the last 15 years. Anything, any last words you would like to, to give to our audience? 
Um, I, I just like to thank you guys. It was an amazing experience and I'm happy to be here and honored to be invited. Had a, had a great time. I didn't even realize that times go so quick. So I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Lazo, for sharing your 15-year worth of experience and wisdom on this podcast. Much appreciated. Adam, any main takeaways from your side? Yeah, so we started the conversation with his big lesson he learned in bankroll management, where he almost went broke, or kind of did go broke, and he learned the lesson of how to build a bankroll and how to not put yourself under too much risk. This left to, led to many choices around how he was going to approach his career. He came up with his winning formula for poker, which was study a lot and find good games, which I think is a useful formula for every player. And yeah, I think just learning the lesson of how do I almost like get past that kind of threshold of building the bankroll. I think a lot of players who are new in their career or even two or three years in are still struggling with that kind of dilemma of how do I get myself above water? His solution was to earn more money and to move up stakes and to uh, build a better bankroll. What I found really interesting as we went through the conversation today was how much a lot of it came back to uh, just getting better just studying, just keep learning. He's had 15 years of continuously learning more stairs. He time blocks 90 minutes daily to study. You, you, magnet, you compound it over, over 15 years. That's a lot of knowledge that's being compounded. And when we try to uh, kind of pinpoint a certain skill or a certain tool, it was hard for him to do that because he's, he's learned so much in those kind of time blocks over a long period of time. So I think that was very useful. He mentioned his critical thinking approach in terms of he has quite a scientific mind. He likes using data. Obviously, more recently, he's got big samples to use data against, uh, how not to fall for survivorship bias, where we use a selection bias, where the mind gravitates towards winners and losers. This can show up in terms of a losing hand of poker or can come in terms of who's winning tournaments and you're uh, gravitating towards. We are just being mindful of what data points are you using to make your decisions or conclusions and where are your feelings uh, dictating over data. You mentioned data overrides feelings. I wrote that one down as well and trying to use a more critical way of thinking about stuff. And then, yeah, like a lot of skills that he mentioned, I think we went into them, I went into them a bit, but in terms of st studying hard, playing a lot, game selecting well. And I think that, that we touched on the end as well, falling in love with studying. This is the one where my coaching as well, working with players on mindset, a lot of times players go through phases where they're just not enjoying the game as much. And very often it's because they're not working on the game, they're not studying as much, they're trying to play a lot of volume, and it becomes a bit mundane. I'm sure any, any player doing the same kind of grind for long enough, especially 15 years, it could get boring. But if you're learning new stuff and you're finding ways to get creative, to uh, learn your strat new strategies, to uh, fine-tune stuff, it can be infinitely fun, infinitely complex, but, but infinitely fun. So I think, yeah, a lot of things about longevity there in terms of his approach to always wanting to get better, I think was, yeah, a really, really big eye-opener for me. How about yourself, Rene? What are some of the, the main things you wrote down? Yeah, I can strongly relate to strategical novelty. For me, at least, it's always been a necessity in order to not burn out and to have a lot of longevity in my poker career. Also, he always went with the curve, right? He said he did adapt on the later side with software when he finally started using. He said, fuck, I should have used this earlier. But still, he did go with the software and he tried to study. I think I think I like that he said, right? Always when you looked in the past, he said poker was so easy. Well, we cannot go back in the past, but we could go into the future. So he would try to gain an edge and outstudy their opponent. So he sort of puts himself in the future. Right, I think that was uh, there was very good knowledge. He indeed also talked about realizing your own skill level and edge level. That there was something that was often misapplied. Right, that people didn't really know their edge in their games, and therefore people were playing in games where they actually didn't have a win rate. Um, solution: make more money. I think you already touched on that as well. I always like these type of one-liners. He reached out actually to quite a lot of coaches as well. He mentioned uh, Paul Auto Internet, which has been mentioned before by some other players as well. Uh, definitely back in the days, great coach. Um, he also mentioned Google's nose, and mainly what this gives you is a different perspective, right? He also said that not necessarily the best player might be the best coach, so it's important when you find a coach to find someone you can relate with. Usually most coaches, you know, they have some sort of free content uh, that you can at least consume to see if you kind of align with their ideas. We also talked about to not rely too much on willpower and discipline. And I think this really ties in nicely to having a bigger goal. I think I gave that example for myself as well. When it was very clear that I wanted to try to become the best poker player, if 
something would come across my path that I didn't that didn't align with that goal. It was just a no. Like I didn't have to think, oh, should do I want to go out drinking with my friends until four o'clock? No, because it's not in line with my goal. So it's very easy. And I feel like when you have less, when you're less dedicated to a longer term goal, then for example, in Laszlo, right? He had a couple of materialistic things that he really wanted, the Lambo that he has, the nice apartment, things that he could look at and be like, yeah, this is like the reward of my poker career. And anytime like doubt would come up, should I go do this? Should I go do, do that? It's quite clear what he should do. No, I'm going to grind because I'm, you know, I need and I want to get this apartment, so I'm gonna sit down and grind. I think he gave the Snickers bar example, right? He thinks, should I get the Snickers bar? Should I not get the Snickers bar? I want the Snickers bar, but it's not so healthy. He just put it a go out there as well. I'm not gonna eat Snicker bar because because it cost me two thousand dollar. So you must really like the Snicker bar if you're gonna eat a Snicker bar of two thousand dollar. So yeah, that uh, is all the points that I wrote down. Thanks again, Laszlo. Thank you, Adam for bringing up great questions as always and co-hosting this podcast with me thank you everyone who made it to the end and actually listens to our main takeaways i want to thank the audience if you liked this podcast give it a thumbs up subscribe to the channel notifications on all that good stuff and i will see you guys in the next episode